Okay, so at 6.03 um, August 2nd, 2021, we will open the meeting uh, in a hybrid fashion of the digital planning board with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in order to cover the first June 16th, 2021 act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including an extension of remote participation provisions of March 20th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws, chapter 30A, section 20. Please note that while the option to promote attendance and participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting or hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technical problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in person versus virtual attendance accordingly. To refer to this in person attendance term, a dear to the host of meeting or is hosting the meeting in the meeting room of the digital municipal offices and remote participation is done on our website. <clears throat> so I will um, call the meeting to order and identify board members in attendance. Um, why don't we just go around the room here and then we can on the screen. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason here. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Kathy Petrova. Kathy Petrova here. Uh, and then this pool here, and Andrew Leachin. I'm here remotely. Okay. And um, I just sent me up here into the future. So we'll note how the answer and um, I think we will now vote for vote to go into executive session. Denise Mason, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Andrea Liebson, yes. Okay, and so now we're going to go into executive session. And if you will excuse us for a moment, we are going to move ourselves to a conference room. And then um, Adam will let you know when we're all there. And we can. Um, Kelly. Uh, Annalie, if you guys want to stay there, I'm just going to shut the door. And Mary just joined, and I can put you into a separate room. So. We're going to sit with this. Uh, Rachel is releasing the locks on the door. If um, it does not appear that other people on the Zoom have done it, don't worry. Yeah, like shiny and Andrea's eyes. Um, oh, really? Like, see? Mm -hmm. So, so you can hardly like, see the. Oh, yeah. I can only see Kathy Watroba. The rest of you are just white. <laughs> it's the light from the. There we go. Ugh. Yeah. I love it on you. I love it. like crap on me. Who is it? I want to work out like these places and then I got it. I don't like it. We have to Much so, better. Thank you. We have, um, we have the possibility of uh, using the next hour to potentially address business that um, does not appear to Well, 
Right. Um, including our public hearings because it doesn't help if the public can't hear. I don't, Emily, I'm not sure. I know that there is some new equipment, but I don't. Not soon. Right. Not right. soon enough. Oh, it's not right. soon enough. It hasn't, been, it hasn't been delivered yet. Well, well, maybe we should hold off on that decision until it is delivered. And you know, Bill is posted because that's why we're doing this because it was posted in the paper as hybrid. That's why we have to be hybrid. And do you know what the equipment's being delivered? Pardon me, I didn't hear. Do you know whether it's sound equipment's being delivered? Um, I think they're waiting for one item. A cart. So we don't know when the sound equipment is being delivered. What if we were to say that we would go remote until equipment has been delivered and has been tested to be sufficient for the piece? I'm not for that. I'm not for that. I think yeah. to the Um, so I'm, I'm all for being 
safe. But I think that our instinct to be together is really strong in this world of like we're about policing, we're about regulating me. And Zoom is not a great neighbor builder. It's just not. It's a it's a it's a presentational medium. One person presents it, another person presents it, another person presents it, and that's we can try to take it away from that. Yes. Well, Kristen is on. You're her resident. There you go. Um, so there, it sounds as if um, there seems to be a consensus in discussion that we will meet by Zoom, but our next meeting will be remote. Cool. We have to work. Yeah, yeah, I think that's consensus. Like, and there's something in the chat. Again, this is the moderator. I'll go back in there. I just. I can't hear anything. And Mary says, so come up here. If you're gonna oh, stay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and Mary, we're coming to you. No, I How's this? Can you hear better? Is this better, Aunt Mary? How's that? Yeah, thank you. Good. The glare is off. That's okay. Here. And here comes Rachel. And we're not social distancing, but we're all right. We're not bumming out your vacation style. Oops, sorry. Can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what were you guys? We are, that's the, the bottom line is that. We are going to determine meeting by meeting what our format will be. And our next meeting will be remote. Do we have any, you know, indication on the horizon that no. this will be workable at some point in the future? No, we don't yet know when the new uh, equipment will be delivered and tested and deemed good and what our decision will be then. The irony is that the irony is that this is a cafeteria and it was meant to like deaden noise. When I was a kid, this was a, a, an elementary school cafeteria. And uh, these were all tables in here and it was meant to <laughs> be quieter. It's awful. And it's always been awful. As long as I've been on the board, this room, people are unhappy about hearing. So it's not just COVID, it's not just COVID. And Mary, um, we scooted across from um, reviewing minutes and it was the minutes of the July 12th meeting. Um, so I'm a little uh, disordered, hold on. So I'm on the wrong one. Yeah. I'm gonna move that we accept the minutes from 7, 12, 21. No, no, sorry, Ed. We're out. We're just running through uh, meeting notes and. So is the meeting still at seven in there? Yes. Well, yes. Okay. It's now though, if anybody wants to come in. Okay. It's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, it's so I guess I still can't hear everything. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. He was from afar. So you are asking for a motion to accept the, the revised minutes of July 12th, 2021. Is that what you said? Yes. I make a motion to accept the revised minutes from July 12th as written. Second. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? No. All right, and we're just going around the table and through the Zoom. Um, Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittrova, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. And Mary Cloutier, yes. Emily Wolfpool, yes. So the meeting minutes are accepted. Um, Adobe sign, we're, we're hopping to under new business. Uh, Excuse me, can I ask, are we allowed to even talk about new business before seven o'clock? It's, it, well, these are uh, uh, logistical and things. And we're being recorded, so it right. is. Okay. 
non it, there's there's no public comment input for what they're talking about andrea okay thank you thank you that's good andrea thank you so um my understanding and uh jen you might want to chime in that uh, all of the boards and appropriate committees are being requested to vote to accept using Adobe Sign, a uh, program, downloaded app program, to facilitate expedited signing of documents. Uh, ben, is there anything extra that we need to say about that? I, I did review the uh, security as stated from Adobe and also the um, reviews and they certainly seem to be positive about the security issue so yeah i i believe that it's very secure the one thing i would like to add is that a and r's need to be signed in person on the mylars so that would be the one document that the board members would need to come in to sign Jim, can you tell us what are the other documents that we would be using the Adobe sign for? Because typically we just come in and sign the, you know, the ANRs. Um, so it would be the decisions. So any uh, site plan review decision, any special permit decision, those are the ones that need the multiple signatures and it would be easy. And generally speaking, you don't need all of us to sign those, right? No. So that's really, it's really kind of more about you. And what would the next steps be after we vote tonight? So then you could just go ahead and tell Sue and I'm not sure like how we have to, I don't know how you get your signature. It, like it, you, you have to sign in and sign, like she'd have to send it to you. You'd have to sign it and then she would she'll, get the confirmation. Yeah. Okay. She'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, and in general, we have an ANR. They bring the mylar and we have it here right away. So we never, in in other worlds, time, the mylar is here. They would be we review the ANR and we sign it right on the spot, as you know. So um, it's not like you have to every time there's an ANR you have to come in the next day mm -hmm. to sign. Mm -hmm. This is just in COVID now yeah, because sure. we're doing it uh, remote. Okay, so really, you. generally mm -hmm. speaking, it's not a okay. Um, could I have a motion that we? The planning board members adopt using Adobe Sign for signing applicable documents. I make a motion that we accept Adobe Sign as a way of signing documents. I second that motion. Any more discussion? No, just when you say that, state your name so that when Ann Mary's writing the minutes. Okay. Sorry. So it was Kathy who most who moved and who seconded it? Kathy. Kathy, <laughs> Kathy and Kathy. <laughs> Kathy S and where? We might have them just do all of those things. Kathy <laughs> S and Kathy W, mm. just like in elementary school. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, vote. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester, mm -hmm. yes. Kathy Wichoba, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Andrea Leibson, yes. yes. Uh, and and Emily will call yes so approved unanimously. Um, at uh, next um, under logistics kind of a new business at our uh, training session we talked about having a formal vote that then I guess would be memorialized in related applications and documents that. All documents that are submitted to the planning board are submitted within one week of our of the applicable business meeting. Mm -hmm. So, some discussion on that. Sounds good. I think the reason why we did that is because if if documents are submitted and we have questions on them, then we would be asking, we would, you know, formulate our questions and just send them to Jen and then Jen would send them to the applicant to make it, you know, so that we would get the answer in time. So that, you know, we get that information in time because if we did it Thursday, like we had previously decided, there's not enough time to get that information in a timely manner for a Monday meeting. And that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. The big question is if it doesn't come in 
it yeah. doesn't come in. We still have to look at it because right. it's stamped. Mm -hmm. True. So I don't think, but I think that asking, you know, I mean, I think our, our the administrative staff, this is a nice alert for them that we are ready for then as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did think sometimes that's happened. And that, and that would show a kind of a lack of good faith on the part of the applicant, that's all. Um, but sometimes it's, it's what they're waiting on to, they're waiting on yeah. their engineer to da, 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 da. So, but I, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable request at all. But also, Rachel, I think that, that the way it's, it's being done now, Jen, if I'm correct, that when the applicant does, it's not coming to us until you have what you deem are all the necessary documents. At that point, it is stamped, and then it comes to us. Oh, is it stamped only after that? That's the way it should be. Right. But I mean, you by necessary documents, check, whatever, whatever. That's usually. Well, I'm going to go through it. And so depending on what the project is, uh, you know, I'm going to be like, you know, if it's a site plan that it looks like it's going to need wetlands information, like make sure that they're meeting the right boards before that, you know, because sometimes people come in, they have no idea. So between Bob and I looking at the plans and looking at the application, we can say, you know, these are the things that I'm going to need. And these are the things that the site plan review application would be very helpful if you had lighting plan, um, sidewalk, you know, to have all of the right numbers to say how much area is being used that all the parts of the application are filled out for you. So you know what the zoning district is, that you you know how much area is being disturbed. Um, you, you know what they're doing as far as removing trees or adding trees. Um, you, you wanna know what kind of trees they're putting in is, are they adding parking? Where is the parking? Like all these little details that Bob and I can work on beforehand. Right. And they can gather that information, even if it's like, you know, I think that you're going to need a traffic study and the board is probably going to request you have a traffic study. So it would be in your best interest. Got it, Jen. Thank yeah, you. Because we got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get it. But we can't require them to have a traffic study before they come to us. That doesn't count. Right. I mean, uh, and in my recollection, too, as we started inching this deadline out more and more, it also had it wasn't just the site plan review applications. It was if additional information um is requested and then we would get it the morning of our meeting or whatnot so it's not just the applications it's other stuff too right so yeah. this i think is as, as Rebecca, uh, rachel was saying that it's a mm, a good faith thing okay, if we right. say that this is what we're looking I for i think it makes it clear it's a clear ask and then they can apologize sorry we didn't get it to you because or whatever mm -hmm. but they they don't have to get all that stuff like it doesn't have to all come in at once mm -hmm. so perfectly if we want something then we ask for it and it comes in another time or whatever right but I, at our training we said that this would need to be a vote of the planning board to make it official so that you could then officially have it be part of the application package and other requests of applicants is that necessary well you already voted that they would have a pre-submittal meeting with me so, yeah, again, I think we're saying in general documents that need to be submitted to the planning board documents uh, would come a week in advance. So would that also mean uh, when we're sending around bylaw review requests and stuff like that? It's not just site plan review, it's right. every other, things that other doc documents. Hmm. Yeah where it would be memorialized. All right, might as well vote on it. So I have a motion that, what's motion? <laughs> we're just having fun with all these motions. Documents, uh, something to the effect that documents being sent to the planning board be distributed, be dis sent so that they can be distributed one week prior to our next business, to the applicable business meeting. Okay. I make a motion that all relevant documents be be received, be sent to the planning board one week prior to our meeting. So let's say by if we meet on typically meet on Mondays, <coughs> we should have it by Tuesday. 
Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. They get Monday. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Tuesday prior to our next Monday meeting. Someone want to second it? I second it. Rachel Blaine. Any more discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Rachel Blaine, yes. Well, Kathy with Trevor, yes. Kathy still has to be yes. Denise Mason, yes. Andrea Leibson, yes. Uh, Anne Marie Cloutier, yes. Who made that motion? Rachel, I know you seconded it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Denise. Denise. And Emily Wolfkull, yes. Uh, so it passes unanimously. Um, hmm. This might be a little bit of um, dancing around, but um, there we're on a tight schedule for what potentially will be town meeting. Uh, town meeting potentially is going to be October 4th. Um, potentially we have coming before that um, our um, solar bylaws. Um, Treehouse may be talking about something in particular to that tonight that we might need to bring to town meeting. Um, and also, if you recall at our um, previous town meeting, we were not able to bring to town meeting the planning board's initiative to change verbiage from select men to select board uh, because of some logistical issues. So what we need to do, in fact, is have a public hearing on that bylaw to change in all the zoning bylaws, um, notice language. language from select men to select board. Um, the, the tricky part about whatever might be our motion or whatnot is I'm not quite sure when our next meeting might be in public hearing meeting mm. because there's Oh, we can do it on September 3rd. Potentially, no. things are right. being... Sorry. Jen, Sorry. can I talk about what might be coming forward? Um, <clears throat> no. You're right. You're right. Okay. I would just wait, because I'd almost think that you, you should just take a 15-minute break. And then when there's more people, okay. I just don't... Okay, so we, we, we've upped it. We've, we've, we've teed it up now so that when we have a conversation about when we might be having public hearings next, this is going to be part of that conversation. Gotcha. Right? So, okay. right. Okay, select board and select men. So, don't want to forget that. Um, I move that we take a 15 minute recess and come back um, at seven o'clock. Okay, we might have one more thing. Know your responsibilities. Do you want to come back and do you want to say that now? Anything from that, folks who attended that? Oh. And then, oops. Oh, yes. And then, can we take a break, and then? Okay, so um, Denise and I attended. Um, There's a motion on the table. Oh, so sorry. I withdraw my motion. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Uh, we attended a public board and commission know your responsibilities meeting. The one thing I took away that I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, whether we have rules in place for addressing the public body, such as time. We have like a time limit on how long someone can speak because, you know, just un subconsciously you may give one member more time than another and that can, you know, that can be bad. Right. So, so should we have a, you know, everybody gets two minutes or whatever. That was brought up in that. And um, is that a, do we, is that, that's good. Do, do we state that and have that as our protocol or do we make policy? Like I like it as a protocol. Mm -hmm. So when we open the public, you know, the two questions or to public comment. Yeah that we say that, that there's a kind of a, maybe we have a path statement that says, we open to, we'd like you to, you know, remain civil, please, you know, address your comments to the board and not to one another. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, then two minutes. 
And then someone has to be responsible for keeping the time because there will be those people that will go over. Yeah. Um, so at, um, and yeah, we could have a red light, like green light. Like a yeah. presidential debate. Mm -hmm. or it, could, it can also, also, because this has happened at other meetings where if someone has already spoken, right. then, you know, put them on the back burner sure. so everybody Well, then everybody speak. speaks once in a meeting, once right. another. Yeah. Not, that, and actually, it gets, try that. Well, you know, I mean, if something else comes up, it may not, someone may speak, it may be about a different issue, but if it's the same issue and they're just mm -hmm. So that could be part of our statement that is, um, those who are, because Dan had something like that, actually, at this past yes. you know, town meeting, we might yeah. want to pinch something from what he said. Yeah. In terms of if you've spoken once to an issue, then um, uh, everybody else should be able to speak before, before you, speak you speak again. again. Um, and so they called it a rule. I mean, whatever we call it, a protocol rule. I don't have think any. about calling it a protocol. So I mean, that gives you wiggle. Yeah. Okay. I would think you'd want some wiggle because sometimes mm -hmm. you just know you got to go back to this person sure. for yeah. some clarification or whatever else. You need to be tired. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, and a two minute maximum, we're thinking. I, I don't know what I should think, be the time, but that's what I've seen other places two minute. I don't know. Um, I really think it depends on what you're talking about. So, with the ZBA, we did three minutes and we used my stopwatch <laughs> and it was not well received. Mm -hmm. Just so you know. Oh, right. Well, that's, you know, okay. By the public. <laughs> Jennifer, when I had a Zoom in the past, there, um, I can't, I don't have my tools right now, but do you have a tool for a timer? Sometimes if you poke around. Yeah, I'll look for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. People one. didn't that like it anyway. You know, that way it's objective. Like the thing went off, you know? Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, it was not it was just not well received as far as um being timed you know but i understand it and so um sometimes i i don't mind as moderating the meeting to be like okay next i think so, that was, I, I remember this happening in some other meeting that you know there was a comment about the men in the meeting got more time to speak than the women and you know i'm not saying it was true or not the point is that some people will perceive it that way mm -hmm. and this takes that out of it because um, <laughs> it is an issue for some people that they don't get to speak or they don't get to speak as long as someone else and they get interrupted or whatever right. i have a, I have a uh, couple uh, not, uh, another takeaway because i've got a couple after um, the only other Since thing was uh -huh. that um people have the right to decline who they are yes when they speak and we can't require them to say who they are. You cannot ask people to sign in at an open meeting. Why are you asking people for that information? And that was, that was they were very specific about that, which I was surprised, Jen. I thought that was interesting. And you know, the other, the other thing, the other really important takeaway, and I found out when we were working, and maybe, I don't know, um, shall and must, is the same according to the attorney on, on the webinar. Okay, so parsing those words, and we 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 took all this time talking about shall. Yeah. Shall is absolutely acceptable. So just you know, a little FYI. For <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Jen. Thank you for uh, telling us about this educational opportunity. And um, we'll continue to report back on various. You know, can I, oh, can I just can I just add to that? You know, I I I didn't I wasn't able to attend all of it because then there was another meeting that I had to, that I had to attend. So I think what I got, and I think this is really important, board member responsibilities, and it really went over our culture as board members, the culture we want to have. Um, we're not there to rubber stamp. We are there to represent our constituents in a reasonable way and um, and to put our own self-interest aside and be, you know, fairness to our constituents, which I thought was a very good reminder, not only for the planning board, but for all of our boards. Um, you know, because we're here, we need to benefit the common good. So and promoting transparency. 
did did they have a link to the full recording afterwards? Because you I think they do. They do. Yes. I just I haven't had a chance because I was when I was away, but I haven't had a chance yeah. to go back. But you know, Kathy and I can take a look and we can send that and send that to everyone. I, I believe I wrote it down. It was pretty. Okay, so and that's pretty much it. Thank if you, you can find the the yeah. link, we'll send it off to you. So um, we maybe can take a five minute break now. Um, if the board so chooses while we and then reconvene at seven o'clock as we said that we would for the remainder of the public meeting. Yeah, yeah and, and just for anybody who's on, I think it's just you, Jeff. Well, there were a couple people on. We were just going over some housekeeping things. We had not opened the actual public meeting. So there was nothing that was discussed. Okay. Okay, I'd make a motion that we take a five minute break. I'm saying that motion, Kathy Wichova. Okay. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. So for the public hearing, we're going to have you guys over there because we're going to use this camera. No, we they can't, can't hear us. They can't hear us. Well, we have the microphones. So no, they don't. They, they, can't. they don't. Hear. No. They want us to check and see if they work. Yeah. Before we do that. We we could. Check and see. Yeah, yeah, they but don't work. It was no. horrible. The last select like, board meeting, we couldn't hear it. We could hear anybody on Zoom. We couldn't hear any of the select board yeah. meetings. Yeah. Zoom people can't hear it, really. I know. I will move that out. Thank you. Oh, uh, so we are resuming our meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board with apologies to everyone for the last minute and almost last minute changes. We have had some challenges with posting of the meeting as well as acoustics. And so we're all just swinging with it, right? We're all just doing what we can. Um, our agenda as it originally was set forward was first with old business to have solar bylaws with us small scale, but um, I don't know if Deerfield resident, is that you Chris C Curtis or not? Maybe not. Okay, so I think Chris was expecting that it wouldn't happen for a while. So let's then move forward to our public hearing on, um, Treehouse, and uh, I'll begin by reading the public hearing announcement, notice of hearing. <clears throat> so the notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold a public meeting hearing on Monday, August 2nd, 2021 at 7 p.m. on an application filed by Treehouse Brewing Company for an amendment to site plan approval of April 26, 2021 for property located at one community place, map 150, lot nine, to modify the approved work and conduct additional work as more particularly set forth in the project narrative and as followed and as allowed in the zoning bylaw chapter 179 section 5400. Application documents have been available for review in the foyer of the municipal offices and online at www.dofieldma.us. Um, meeting tonight is being held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation with a reminder that uh, for purposes of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield is, in fact, having our in-person meeting here in the main meeting room at the Deerfield Municipal Offices, and remote participation is noted on our town website. So with this, I will um, open our public hearing with a reminder that uh, for members of the public and for members of the board as well, but we will be working to speak one at a time, recognized by the chair. Um, we are working to respect our Deerfield Code of Conduct to be respectful, considerate, 
courteous and knowing that we're setting an example for everyone else to follow. Um, we want to be concise and non repetitive with our with our comments. Everyone speaking once on the issue and and hopefully no more than a couple of minutes maximum. Um, Jen, can you verify that uh, notices were sent out to abutters? Yes, we did receive notification from um, Mark Forstein that they received their filings back. Great, thank you. So our process tonight will be that um, the applicant will present an overview of their application. The planning board then will have an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant, and then we will take public comments. And um, at that point, uh, then when we close the public hearing, we then, as a planning board, will have deliberations. All right. So um, with that, um, if the applicants come forward and present, or however they want to come forward, I don't yeah. know what's happening. Good evening. All right, so how are we going to orchestrate this? So Jen, are you able to put um, the slide deck on the screen? Yes. yes. I have to direct you because I don't know if there's any way for me to control it from the screen. No. Okay. We're just gonna be at your mercy this evening. Do you see it? Yes. Super. Okay. So uh, good evening, um, members of the planning board. Uh, for the record, Mark Borenstein, an attorney at the law firm Badge and Dewey and Worcester. Uh, I represent the Brewery Company, which I believe you all know. Um, this evening, I'm joined uh, remotely by Amy Goodrow, who's one of the owners of Trias Brewing Company. And in person, we're joined by Kim Gordonsky of Trias Brewing Company, and Tony Monsesti of SVE Associates, um, the civil engineer from Trias Brewing Company, and also Jane Davis, who is remote, who is Trias Brewing Company's um, uh, traffic engineer. So she is on, on online. So let's do the first, first slide. So um, just to kind of orient the board, because I know some of you are, are, are new to the planning board. Um, so since the approvals were, so there's been two approvals that were previously granted, one by the ZBA, which was a special permit for a major commercial project. And for, before the planning board, we saw an April site plan approval, which was granted. Now the site plan review was granted in connection with certain improvements. Most of them were interior. The only exterior was the grant of, of approval for this exterior portico. I don't know if I'm touching the screen. <laughs> so sorry. Um, so since that time, since those grants, Treehouse has commenced operations, which has been fantastic. Um, it's received this great reception from the town of Deerfield and folks in the area. Um, Treehouse has received um, the approval from Select Board for its uh, pouring license, its Farmer Series pouring permit, which is granted to a farmer brewery, and has also received a negative determination of applicability from the Conservation Commission related to the, uh, the improvements that uh, that some of you um, uh, witnessed or was explained to um, when, you, when we did the site walk. So uh, before you this evening are two applications: one, the application for site plan amendment and the stormwater permit. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Tony Wenceski, the civil engineer, to speak to the actual site improvements. And then once he's done speaking to the site improvements, I'm gonna speak to the interior improvements and the potential um, standards um, generally uh, uh, that are, are provided in the zoning bylaw. And also um, Treehouse's analysis uh, with respect to those standards as to um, the, the satisfaction of those standards. But Tony, would you like to? We'll go to the we'll go to the next slide, Jen. Please. We'll go to sheet five of so so I, I kind of go in order here, Tony. So oh, okay. so here's the aerial of the site improvements, right. and then if you just keep going down the line, yeah. um, the slide should fall. Oh, out. actually, yeah. Okay, this is perfect. This Great. is this is the proposed um, an overview of the proposed um, work for phase two. So essentially what we're doing is we're going from a uh, private printing company use with a lot of amenities, which are really, really nice, um, to uh, phase two is really the west front use for trees. 
Tony? Yes. Can you speak towards the television for the people at home? All right. So, All right. show them where the mic is. Right, is it right up here. Right here. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank Sorry you. About that. Um, so, when going to the restaurant use, we're going to have four areas or four work areas. This area was phase two. I mean, phase one, which is the portico area, which um, Mark was just talking about. Um, these improvements are essentially cosmetic, and they're some of it to try to uh, accommodate the new performance standards, the green performance standards, but also to provide better accessibility to the facility. So with that, on the northwest corner, or the west side of the warehouse, north of uh, the main office building, up in this area, um, we're going to add some additional parking. So when we're out on the site visit, our limits of work are the edge of the travel lane, in the back of this walk to the ramp and essentially the back of the walk there. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna take out four white pines, they're fairly old, and um, we're gonna replace that by planting seven Cosa dogwoods around the new planting area. With this planting area um, and parking area, we're gonna have eight electric charging vehicle stations there. Uh, some of Treehouse's employees actually have those vehicles and um, so we're going to we're going to provide that. Uh, there's you know some green space here, and we're keeping the existing lighting. So we set the island so that existing street light and that can can stay. Um, this was done. I think the warehouse stuff was done in the late '60s. So they, the ADA code was not as strict as it is now. So they really don't meet code standards. There's a parallel space here. You have to go to a ramp there. So what we're going to do is we're going to move. This curbing over on the south side of that parking area, and we're going to put in four ADA handicap spaces. And um, we're also going to put in a bike rack over on that area because we think a lot of people will bike to this area. And um, just new walks. But the big thing about this, this line out here is the riverfront area to the brook. So we've tried to keep everything within the degraded area south, all of our work tucked into where the existing pavement is. And so in order to improve that riverfront area, we have the availability to put in porous pavement there. And that's another one of the green standards. So that whole area in here, well, that pavement will be removed and that will become porous pavement. And in as part of the stormwater permit, in that stormwater management plan, there is a maintenance and operation, very small because we have robust um, catch basins and, and stormwater systems throughout the site. We've done very well back in the day. Um, so there are a couple of things in there, how to manage that porous pavement, but also to uh, a, a schedule on when they should go in and, and vacuum out the catch basins. There was nothing like that required back in the day. So we're going to enhance that. All of this drainage goes to the book. Jeff, quick question about forest pavement. What's the maintenance long term? Oh, maintenance long term um, is you can't sand that in winter and it yeah. doesn't really freeze. Oh. It's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so they, you can salt. They probably won't because you won't need it. Um, and you just got to make sure that you don't get like this lawn or everything drains that way that it's not fully vegetating. You get runoff and you get soil into the paint. It will clog it up. And there's no remedy. Right? So you vacuum it, you get these high vacuums. And then they also, um, when you plow, uh, you have skids on the bottom of the plow, so it won't throw it up. The only problem where I designed it locally, where you want, you want to see it and see it work, is up at Kringle Candle on the east side where the warehouse is. So you're going north, farm table and um, you know, um, Hitchcock and all of that are on the left side. It's on the right side, not the aisles, because that's where the trailer trucks and that, you know, it, I didn't put it there, but all the parking there it is. So when you, I haven't seen it in a while, but when I used to watch that, you get like three, four feet of water off of that hard asphalt into that and be gone. Hmm. And it doesn't freeze. It does. It's amazing how it really works. The only problem why we didn't do more of that is it scuffs in some real heat. It'll scuff. You'll see a little scuffing of it, and that wasn't pleasing for my client. It's it's a it, yeah, it looked, um, because it's it's like what you'd have for old McCann, it's big stone, yeah. and the water just filters down and down. So instead of like a, an 18 inch section in here, we've got like a 30 inch, 32 inch section, because we've got stone, different bearings to, to um, settle out and, and filter out this one. So 
the reason why we're doing that is it helps improve water to uh, storm on runoff to the to the um, to the stream, but also we're going to do some areas around back here where we're going to add some impervious area. And that's mainly ADA, ADA accessibility, adding some employee parking, and having a place for the dumpster, which I'll get to next. So what I'm doing is, is trading off, and actually with the phase two improvements, we'll be reducing the impervious area. Not by a lot, but it's like 600 plus square feet. So, so that's probably the biggest improvement there. On the, on the, in the loading dock area, which is on the north side of the building, there is um, uh, one loading dock door on the west side, right, right where that cursor was right here. And that dock is not functional. If you look at it, it's only up like 16 or 18 inches off the pavement. So it's not good for wheeling stuff out. It's not even a good step down because typically stuff will be six or seven inches tall. Um, so right now, because they're doing the work here, that's where the on the fly uh, happens. They're gonna build an actual concrete ramp there and uh, landing will be real. And so that they can wheel dollies out of there if they need to. The other improvement is on the east side. Um, this facility has a railroad spur. I don't know if you saw it. So, so they must have thought, and I don't know if they did it, I don't recall um, whether they moved the materials in and out by rail. I just don't recall, but it was set up for that. And so there's a bumper here, and there's a, oops, there's a bumper here, and there's also a loading dock right here with a lift. So they must have been able to get it out of the cars and bring it in. Yeah, really pretty cool stuff. So that's where Treehouse wants to put their recycling dumpster. They want to use that. It makes perfect sense to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take out a little bit of lawn area here. We're going to pour concrete pad for the dumpster, put in some pavement here. This all drains to the loading dock, so it doesn't get to this wetland area over here. And that heavy dark line is just erosion control barrier to protect it um, so that we can bring trucks in. They'll come in back in here, get the dumpster, and then they can leave. If you look on this area, on the, on the east side of the warehouse, we're adding 14 parking spaces there. It's kind of a new space, it's lawn, grass, and this design on this building, which is pretty cool also, is they, they extended the walls inside the building so that they could put dirt up against it so it didn't look that tall. It's kind of a visual, really a, quite a visual improvement, and, and it just plays with your eyes a little bit. So, and back here, we're right up, you know, there's great screening here. We, we have Pelican behind us, um, the railroad behind us. So we're going to take that out and we're going to add 14 um, spaces there for, they're going to be for employees. Um, uh, they'll figure out, they may have employees park back here and let customers park there. Um, with this thing, because most of our parking is set up to the north of the facility, our way of getting here too is to walk this walk go in the main room, go over to get to there. Or you can walk down here, walk over here, take a trail and walk over. And in phase three, we're gonna improve some of those trails in that, but we didn't do that at this point, it's not part of it. But the other big thing is because getting back to there, to the patio and, and, and the restaurant will be in the ground floor of the winter garden building, um, we're gonna have a shuttle. So this is dead space here. It's not parked for parking. I think they probably park trailer trucks there, you know, up from the loading dock. So we'll we'll have electric carts or yeah, whatever um, treehouse purchases to move people. But you'll be able to stand here and get a ride back there, and turn around, and pick people up there and bring them back to the parking lot. So just shuttle them back and forth if they don't want to walk. So Tony, agenda for next slide. They're all zoomed in. Yeah, no, I'm walking around. Then we'll go into the detail. So so that's the. Phase, I mean, phase two, section two area. Now on the site improvements um, three and four, the existing patio, beautiful amenity, but it's brick and it's kind of uneven. And you know that's where we're gonna have outside seating and that. So we're removing that um, and we're gonna put in um, some stamped concrete. There's two trees there that we're saving and um, they removed the overgrown, I think it was cedar and juniper in between those retaining walls. That's all gonna stay. They're gonna replant that. Um, there are steps down. So there's different elevations in that patio. So what we have to do when we do that concrete, we're gonna still have some steps, but we gotta put in some ramping. So people can get down, say they wanna get way over to the west side of that patio, they'll be able to. Because this is really back of house work area for the 
um, for the printing in that we're going to we put in two ADA spaces here and add some accessible walks to get to the patio. So when they drop them, they'll have an accessible path back into the patio. This is an existing DG trail. We're just gonna improve that and then make a connection up here because we're gonna widen that out a little bit with gravel, that gravel back there that goes back to the basketball court, which is on the other side of those trees there. And we'll have space there for food trucks. So food trucks will, you know, the employees they can come through and get their food and run it right through the kitchen out. Or if they're out in the patio, they can bring it out and eat so customers sitting at the, at, at the, at the patio. Um, I'm going to widen this loading dock just a little bit. There's a little bit of a grass area there. Um, if you were to look at there, there's a guard rail and the generator there. I'm just going to stand out. So it just gives us a little turning around for those parts. And they take patrons. Yes. Yeah. So that's. Are any loading there? Is there going to be any truck? Well, I, that, that, is, that is not a loading dock, but it is access. There's two doors. Yeah. And it's right grade level. It's not like the loading docks here. Yeah. So um, you could, I mean, for that kitchen area, say yeah. they wanted to, outside this area, there's a widened concrete, good thing you brought that up, but there's a widened concrete pad there, and that's where the wood fire pizza oven go. Yeah. So, if, so bringing in supplies to for support that. the kitchen use, they could use that there and, yeah. and drop it out there. And, um, so that's the overall well, site. Well, come in here too as well, this, this road's. Um, no, it's no, there's no further access there. I think most deliveries will come, you know, like beyond the flying all that comes to this loading dock. It might be the only thing that would go here it would be any service, like for the food service. That's what I mean. Yeah, that yeah. But it, those would be small trucks. Those would be, you know, box trucks or box something trucks. like that. Yeah, so not. There's, that, there's plenty of space for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that is the um, that's the overall picture of what we're doing. As I said, it's pretty much cosmetic. That's what the restaurant needs some accessibility and also trying to bring in some of the standards that was recently approved in town. Um, Jen, can you go to two, not that one, the next one? Um, so it'll be five, slide five. Yep, you can zoom out just a little bit. Okay, so this is just a blow up. This is more of the engineering plan. That's why I wanted to start with that other stuff, but you can see the. You know, these are the coast of dogwoods that in plant will be planted. That's the existing street light. Um, these are the electrical vehicle charging stations, so we can get two on either side. Uh, this walk will be good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. And so, because this is a full height curb here, except for that, that was their aisle um, aisle way to get in. This will all be redone, and that's. A bicycle rack. We may find that we might do more bicycle racks if yeah. it's needed, but that's a start. Um, and this all goes to the There's a really comfortable shoulder, it's probably yeah. eight, at least eight feet. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. So all of these nice oaks in here, and you know, I think there might be a few maples, those will all stay. They're nice hardwood. We're keeping those. Um, that, all that grass is it'll, it'll be there. Um, on this side, it's just like I said, that's that concrete dock to, I mean, concrete pad to utilize that loading dock right there, which was rail loading. And this little grass strip here will be paved so we can get the trucks in and out. Um, those are the 14 additional spaces here up against the building. And um, and fire is that a, a fire ingress as well? It is. Yeah. So there won't be any parking on this. I talked to Dennis, yeah. and they'll they don't they don't want people parking on that. Um, yeah. These spaces are fine, but if they have to lay holes or stuff like that, I mean, this we've got a twelve inch water main on site. It's owned by the South Vehicle Fire District, so we've got plenty of adequate mm -hmm. water, and there's hydrants around the building, so it, yeah. it's great. Yeah. But they they you know if they have to drop holes and go back because there's a hydrant right over here, I believe. Um, they don't want people parking there because it makes it difficult. Yeah. Anymore. So that's, you know, parking is always an issue in Dubai. And so we're trying to find where we can, but also be um, conscious of, you know, the theme of the site and keep as much of the gas area in that. So this is this is hidden from everybody and it just might as well be it then. Uh, next slide, Jennifer, please. Uh, yeah, you can go skip another one. This is just grading. That won't, won't bore you with that. Yep, there you go. So this is the existing condition, but we surveyed all of this. 
No, it's actually one up. So it's actually a development. So these are the two trees that we'll be saving. Um, we have multiple accesses. Really, I think at some point there was going to be another building through the chute that way south. At some point, but then oh, never. Okay. Yes, I just saw a lot of old schemes of like almost like residence where you'd have somebody come in, almost like a college where they come in for a little while and then go. I saw a plan of that from the archives. So, yeah. Um, so all of these walls uh, would be staying. This is going to be um, all replanted. This is, you know, the hardscape area is the hardscape area. It's not getting increased or anything because we're held by grace. These are up high compared to down below. And these are steps getting back up to grade here. This is a bocce ball court. Um, I think they might save that and upgrade that. Patrons love to do things yeah. when they go to treehouse. Um, so these, these are the- only take you so far. <laughs> right, right. These are the steps. So we'll, we have ramps going in here. So you can get from this level down to that level to that level. And this, over in that area, this is inside the building is the auditorium right in this area. That area right there, we had designed an outdoor amphitheater. Yeah. So we're going to put that back. Yeah. yeah, so you can sit outside. There's like a little raised area here where you could have, you know, a guitar player and people could sit down. And so it's just a nice amenity. We're going to plant a few more Do you know trees over here. Cool? What would be very cool is if kids could come here, like if you could, like uh, any kind of elementary school thing too, that would be a great outreach deal. Yeah. Or even local students that are musicians. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I think if you talk to them, it'll probably come out more at the ZBA, but community events and things yeah. like that. Uh, I, I think they're, they're into that. And that would be really wonderful for the community. Here's the pizza oven area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a straight shot into the kitchen where you can get the indoor seating. This is um, more to service over in this area. This is all that gray, but it goes up about three feet to get to the top. So that's why we we're putting in two ADA accesses and then these ramps are all ADA accessible. So um, people could have a very gentle walk there. They're 5% or less. And this is when we drop people off, um, they'll be able to get through there. Uh, Jennifer, next slide, please. Can I just mention something, Tony? Yeah. I'm planning board members are saying something. Can you speak up? Because I just got a message that they couldn't oh, can't hear. Yeah, okay, sure. Thank you. So these are the two white pines that we have to remove. And then we're going to plant some more trees there. That's the two ADA spaces. And this is the minor widening in towards that area for um, food trucks. That's a new DG uh, connection path there. So that won't be asphalt, that needs to be DG. This is all, this is DG. Yeah, this is the end of the um, disintegrated granite. It's a stone. It's stone. Yeah. And so this is paved to here. So we're just going to keep that gravel as it is right now. There's gravel all the way out to the basketball. And these oaks in here, these will all stay. It rings that trail and it nice. makes it's really nice. And mm -hmm. Damien loves it. So we're, we're not touching any of that. It's going to stay. And um, this is the little area of, of, I'm going to pave here to give me a little bit more turning around for the, uh, for the um, shuttle. Um, all of our, like I said in our phase one, sewer and all of the sewer and electrical comes from across the railroad. Uh, and water comes across the railroad. Um, gas, you know, uh, communications come from five and ten. Sewer come up under the railroad. Yes, there's two, two sleeves that. Um, well, there could there were two schemes. I don't know which one was Joe. Actually, there was a gentleman that was the facilities person here, that is now in the conservation commission or the planning board in Conway that I talked. Stage and how you bump into people. He said, "I can't remember." I said, "Do you remember if they put in one sleeve or two? So I saw both designs, I don't know, but the water and the sewer across the tracks and you know, one sleeve or two individual sleeves. And, and, so, and what did you say, communications and? And gas coming yes. from, from the west side, five and 10. So I think that's it for me. I don't think I missed anything, come on. What did you say, electrical comes in? Come, electric comes in this way across the Under. tracks, goes to the bug pool, goes down. The, yeah. The... yeah. There is um, communications that run along the track. You'll see the markers in the office. Yeah. We're not yet. Yeah, that. Yeah. No. Rachel? Rachel, can you scoot in between so we can hear you better? Not entirely. I won't talk anymore, Jennifer. I promise. <laughs> I'm done. No, you can talk. We just want to hear you. I just was asking about the uh, 
the water, I just need a clarification, water and um, electric coming above and below the train tracks. That was my speech. Back to Mark. Thank you so much, Tony. So, so Tony did a great job explaining the exterior uh, improvements, site improvements. Um, so when you look at, and it's in your packet, the green standards and the site plan review standards, you will see that a lot of the standards really aren't applicable because this is an existing building and the site improvements are pretty minimal. That being said, um, we've sought to minimize the removal of vegetation. We've sought to address the green standards by installing forest pavement. We're proposing eight EV charging stations, which will greatly improve the access to electrical charging um, in Deerfield. Uh, we're promoting bikeability by installing those bike, um, but, but a lot of people to park their bikes and, and promoting that. Um, we'll also encourage, Treehouse will encourage yeah. folks to carpool to further minimize traffic on site and we also. Um, at Treehouse Brewery. Right, good. Yeah, just all the greenhouse gases. I don't know who's speaking, but anyways. So those are the exterior, um, those are the exterior improvements. And as you see in the application uh, materials, We've satisfied the applicable green standards and the site plan standards. So now, uh, Jen, if you do the next slide, I just want to speak briefly just about some of the interior improvements. So we trigger site plan review because there, there are multiple standards, one being the change of use. We're adding additional use, and I'll speak to that in a second. But there's also additional parking spaces, as Tony referenced. Um, and there's also um, disturbance of land, which I think is the third trigger for site plan review. So there's multiple reasons why we took a site plan review, but I just want to speak to the interior improvements because that speaks to um, the, the proposed use. So in terms of, um, and just, um, just to kind of orient folks, there are three buildings and this is building A, this is the most northerly of the buildings. So um, this building was modified um, as part of the phase one uh, improvements. And again, just to orient folks who weren't part of the planning board before, um, Trias is proposing the development of this property in three phases. So the first phase was really just getting the brewery operations installed, starting um, sales for, for off-premises consumption. Now we're moving into the on-premises consumption through the proposed restaurant use and adding additional entertainment amenities. And then phase three will be an enhancement even above and beyond that. And so we'll return to the planning board for, for that particular modification. But in terms of building A, um, the only real modification that we're proposing as part of phase two is this area. So um, as part of phase one, a portico was proposed. Treehouse is no longer going to move forward with a portico. What they're proposing instead is this awning. And as part of that awning, they're removing the vestibule um, um, that, that's existing. It's in here. Um, and they're um, adding or, or removing and adding new doors. So that's just really the only aspect of the phase two improvements that affects um, building, um, building A. Next slide, Jen, please. This is building B. This is the more southerly building. This is kind of the entrance way. So think the EV char charging stations are over here. This is where you walk in. Um, this will have um, uh, retail sales, kind of welcoming and orienting folks to um, the Treehouse facility. There's offices, but generally um, this building is, yes. Where are we coming from? building uh, A, right up there, right? Right here. Yep, thank you. Yeah, so we're just going south. Yep. So, but folks are gonna enter um, this way from the yep. parking lot. Um, and so you'll enter Mark, retail sales. Yes. Is it where my pointer is, just so people online, because they can't see you? Yes, that would be towards building uh, A. A. Correct. And so you walk down that hallway, you've got some toilet rooms here because um, folks might have taken a long journey to get to Treehouse, to get to Deerfield. And so then you will follow this line here and that will take you to building C, which is really the, the main um, uh, aspects of the proposed interior improvements that are part of phase two. So if you could go to the next slide, Jen. So this is the existing layout. So folks might be used to this or, or, or recall this property during the, the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations or their experience with the Channing Deep building. Um, some of this work has already, um, they've gotten a, a demolition permit for, for certain aspects of it, um, but essentially there's going to be the demolition of some of these interior walls. Um, this right here is going to be demolished to uh, facilitate the installation of, of new toilet rooms. Um, there's going to be slight improvements uh, with respect to the kitchen, um, and these, these planters are going to be removed as well. So if you want to go to the next slide, Jen. 
So this is the plan that was uh, that's included in your materials. I would say this is 90%, 95% of what's being proposed. The next slide is what's is, is there's a slight modification. So um, Treehouse's architect uh, has been hard at work um, and working with Tony as well to improve accessibility to the site. That it's very important at Treehouse that everyone's able to ac access this property. And so thinking thoughtfully about accessibility and, and ease. Initially, we were proposing a, uh, a ramp that would provide access to, um, to the restaurant area in building C, the winter garden level. Um, and, and, and generally you'll see there's new tables um, and uh, there's this new koi pond, which is gonna be really exciting. Treehouse loves koi ponds. If you've been to the Charleston facility, they, they're members of the koi pond association. Kim would know better than me. Um, but anyways, they're installing this new cooler. Um, there's going to Don't be a, them. sorry? Don't release them. There's been a lot of bad what? press about releasing koi and fish. Oh no, da Damien <laughs> is our outdoorsman. He, he knows all good, about it. Good, good. So um, there's um, there's a tap service counter uh, for, for pouring purposes. And you've got the kitchen that will provide food service as part of the pizza oven that Tony referenced before. Um, and down below here, there's a small section, um, which will be um, sectioned off, which will be part of the distillery operations. So the beauty of adding the distillery um, uh, will allow a treehouse to also serve um, uh, distilled spirits and cocktails at the facility in addition to beer, which it's currently doing in Charlton and it's pretty successful. And they're very tasty. I can personally attest to that. <laughs> so, um, so these are the general site uh, interior improvements um, the auditorium is staying in effect, staying in its, in, in its current condition. There might be some slight modifications in terms of the seating um, to improve accessibility, but the auditorium's remaining. Um, and then you're going to have a, um, an additional um, um, uh, space for, for the restaurant. So, Jen, can we go to the next slide? Because this is a private space. Oh, that's what I was wondering about. Yeah, so it's listed as special dining. <laughs> um, so, it could potentially be a private dining if folks wanted to have a private event. They could section that off if you know you want to have a birthday party or retirement party. Um, um, so that, that's that's that was part of Treehouse's proposed um, operations for Charlton before COVID nineteen. They've since pivot, pivoted because folks aren't doing a lot of in person um, festivities at this time for, for obvious reasons. So this is um, again the previous plan that you saw. The only difference now is um, we've got this ramp right here. And now there's going to be a lift as opposed to um, the uh, the ramp that was proposed over here. Uh, it's it it's it's going to provide better accessibility. So um, this was kind of tight for for folks coming in and out. So um, that's okay. part of as. So how do they, they access that that entrance? So, how, I, I, so this this oh, is this I is. Oh, I get it. That's the. No, so this is the interior of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, I mean. So, Where does somebody who's in a wheelchair say? So they would come through here up the up the ramp. Okay, so start start from the beginning. Yeah. Um, they could have folks drop them off right here, right? So this we have this a, new turnaround turn area. So that way folks aren't coming through the entire building or having yeah, to yeah. go traverse the, the front of the building. Um, or if, if they are able to, they could get into the shuttle that would bring them down as well. They could park up here. Um, with additional accessible spaces that we're adding to the parking lot and they'll be able to um, travel up this this walkway which is um, complies with the um, architectural access board regulations and the ada requirements they'll enter this hallway here and then they'll be able to enter um, through that left so right they there. can't really use the other the, i mean there will be this bridge from using the other entrance they can use whatever entrance they're capable of or, or have the ability to use Right. Um, uh, there is accessibility from the north end as well. Yes, there's elevators. Yes, there, it's it's generally flat. Um, it's just it's a longer distance. So um, yeah. I was just to say. So will we have associated signage that people know. Certainly, there's going to be signage. Um, the great thing about the Trios, there's there's wayfinding signs. There's mm -hmm. also staff everywhere. Right. Okay. People welcoming you. For a lot of people, it's their first time. They might need greater assistance. Whatever someone needs, Treehouse will provide that particular service to make sure that their experience is, is equal or better to anyone else. So, um, so people can enter through the hallway, through that kind of main entrance in building B that I was referencing before, or they can enter right here. Um, if they want to, um, they can then 
um, exit onto this patio area. And then they could go over towards the, um, the amphitheater or sit over here if there's um, some, some uh, live entertainment or if there's live entertainment over here, um, wherever, they, wherever they need to be. So that is the um, interior uh, improvements. Um, Jane, can you go to the next slide, please? And this is kind of zoomed in. You can see it a little bit more clearly. So um, I'll speak to the uses, and there's quite a few of them, so I don't wanna, I've written them down, so that way I don't um, um, miss them. In addition to the accessibility and the green improvements, um, there's also a lot of code improvements. So updating sprinkler systems, updating, the fire alarm systems for, for um, safety purposes. So in terms of the uses, we have the phase one uses that were already permitted by the special permit for major commercial project that was um, granted by the ZBA um, back in April. That was for the brewery, that was for retail sales for off-premises consumption, warehousing. So the new uh, uses will include the proposed um, restaurant use with consumption on-premises. So the treehouse will be uh, producing pizza. Um, over time, they're also going to, they're going to introduce food trucks. Um, they welcome area businesses, area restaurants to bring their food truck and, 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 and supplement the existing restaurant operations in the building. Um, they'll also be uh, potentially doing retail sales on premises. So um, uh, over time, they might decide that they want folks to be able to pick up a four pack while they're in the tap room as part of their restaurant and, and brewery use. Um, there will also be uh, potentially uh, concerts and shows. And so just to differentiate, and I know I've spoken to some of the uh, planning board members when we did the site visit. Um, so shows are generally live entertainment to accompany the uh, restaurant mm -hmm. use on premises, while the concerts are be a ticketed event. So, and I'll get to, the, I'll get to um, Treehouse's recent analysis regarding sound um, later. Um, in addition, um, Treehouse makes a mean cup of coffee. Uh, they roast their own beans. Um, so potentially down the road, they might sell their own copy as well. Uh, they've previously done that in Charlton. So they're, um, for, when we appear before the zoning board of appeals, we'll be requesting these particular uses. And they're all in the materials before you. Um, and, and then um, most, not most importantly, but very important, um, the proposed um, additional manufacturing uses for alcoholic beverages. So Trias is currently proposed, has, has the approval for, um, from brewery from, on the federal level, state level. And now we're, where hopefully we'll have the state approval for the, the pouring permit. Given that the supply board has approved the pharmaceutical pouring permit, we will now be applying uh, for a distillery, a federal um, distillery permit, a distilled spirits plant, which will allow them to produce distilled spirits um, on the premises, and also a winery, which will allow them to produce um, products that are permitted um, under a winery license. So currently in their uh, facility in Woodstock, Connecticut, they produce cider that seems to be very popular um, with consumers. Um, so Long term, the plan would be to include um, the winery use to have cider um, served on the premises. So something for everyone in terms of, um, of, of adult beverages. So so those are the proposed uses. Uh, I have a quick question. Of course. Do they have a, a non-alcoholic brew? Um, so in terms of beer or yeah. beverages, they do not have a non-alcoholic brew. However, they make fantastic seltzer. Yeah. Uh, they make cold brew. So there is plenty of options for folks that don't drink alcohol beverages. You know why they don't have a non-alcoholic beer? I asked this because I was once told that, that breweries, especially smaller breweries, don't have them because there's an emissions tax for the alcohol. Do you know if that's accurate? I do not know that. Okay. I have no clue. It doesn't taste very good. Yeah, I mean, it's something to explore, um, but they don't currently make a non-alcoholic non beer. Um, so, so those are the proposed uses uh, within the building. Um, it's providing your materials, but I just respectfully request um, as part of the site plan review process, there are technical waivers that we would request given the minor site improvements, one being the plan scales, um, given that it's such a large site, uh, the scales are, 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 are different. So we'd ask the, the scales that are provided in the plan materials to be accepted in lieu of the scales that are provided in the, in the, in the zoning bylaw. And also um, trees that are being, uh, the proposed removed trees, um, I believe it's six removed, 13 added. So it'll be net positive of seven trees. Um, the sizes of the trees are provided on the plans. Um, so we'd ask that that be acceptable to, to the board in lieu of providing a tree plan, which is required in the zone. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a new standard. So, right, right. Um, 
But we wanted to make sure that we've, 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 we've uh, addressed all of the uh, requirements and the criteria in the zoning bylaw. Um, just really quickly, in terms of parking, you have a parking table um, in your materials. There's, a, there's ample parking based on the proposed uses within the building. Um, our calculations are that the proposed uses require 269 spaces. We're proposing 282 spaces. Um, in addition to the, the proposed number of parking spaces, um, Treehouse has studied extensively the potential traffic impacts. I recall um, before the planning board and, and in particular the ZBA, there were very there were quite a few concerns about the traffic to the site related to the sale um, uh, of off-premises consumption. Um, I've been there quite a few times, and there seems to not be a backup of cars. Treehouse does a good job of of moving people along. Um, uh, so I, I think that you're I think, talking about Charleston. No, I'm talking about deer here. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, right? It's this is a totally different ballgame. It's it's a smaller operation than, than Charlton for sure, um, but it's definitely meant to provide everyone the treehouse experience that they would get in Charlton. So in terms of the traffic for, for for cars entering the parking lot, there generally has not been at least as far as as far as I know, there hasn't been um, backups onto five and ten, which people currently, currently which but people this are is a totally different. Correct. Yeah. Which brings me to my next point. Um, so we have Jane Davis on uh, on the, in the meeting. But just to briefly summarize her findings, which are included in your materials, um, she studied the traffic counts. Um, she compared the current traffic volumes for, against uh, the volumes in Charlton and what the anticipated uses would be. And based on her findings and her traffic study, as a traffic engineer, she determined that the impacts as part of phase two would introduce a minimal increase in terms of, of traffic to the site. And she does make some recommendations in terms of, of the lights. Um, but uh, if you have any questions about that analysis, she's definitely on here to answer those questions. I just have a question before um, someone asked, can you ask about how concerts will affect parking spaces? Yes. Sure. Absolutely. So, um, so in terms of parking spaces, so we have 286, 82 parking spaces. If you look at the, um, Jed, let me go to the next slide. We lost it. It's a fun graphic, so I want you guys to see it. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, there's 282, 282 spaces. As I said before, we're definitely gonna encourage carpooling, but the entertainment license that was approved by the select board is capped at 500 people. So there won't be thousands of people on site. And this was from one of the concerts in Charlton with Jeff Tweedy of Wilco. Um, this is a photo I took. It was a really charming evening. Um, there were Children was actually a child sitting right there, so it's 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 very a family friendly entertainment, um, and um, it's it's really exciting to bring these these acts to Deerfield. Um, so so traffic on site, um, they would they generally try to limit the number of people on the premises, one from a noise perspective, but also from a traffic and parking perspective. So at most there can be 500 people in terms of occupancy on the premises at one time, which should be. Um, uh, served by the 282 parking spaces, given that generally they sell at least two tickets um, uh, per order. One other question. Um, who can get the mass DOT to change the timing of the lights? I know that was in here, and I think one of them was one second. And the other one was yeah, two seconds. It, it's, it's not a requirement. It's just a recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Jane has been speaking with uh, the representatives from mass DOT reviewing the findings um, and to the extent that they want to implement those changes, they, they can. Mm -hmm. So we've been actively in, in contact with DOT keeping them apprised of, of, the, of the project. Thanks. We, we made a full submittal to District 2 to see how they control 5 and 10. Right. So um, those recommendations or the other improvement that we're going to do coming out Morning. of the ground. Oh, sorry. Yeah, why don't you go on? Um, so we made um, submittal to Mass DOT District 2 office. Mm -hmm. um, just like we did for phase one, um, asking if they were going to require an access permit. Phase one, they did not. They asked that they could have phase two some of those we have. I have not heard back. They seem to be very busy. I know Jane has been talking with their traffic engineer regarding our analysis. Um, the recommendations, they may accept them and do that. Um, but at our driveway exit, exiting, there right now there is not a stop fire and a stop sign. And I didn't even, didn't even, 
bring out to me, but Jane said that's a recommendation. So part of our improvements here would be a stop sign installation and a 12 inch wide stop bar um, leaving um, onto five and 10. So as soon as we know, I mean, um, you know, if we have to go through the access permit, things they have all the information, mm -hmm. I just got to do the paperwork. So um, when there's a concert, you're going to want police. Absolutely. Yeah. The okay. police and details. That is, uh, police details are paid for by the. By Absolutely. The okay. There's be very clear. Treehouse is very happy that police details are in concerts. Yep. If there are certain times of the year where they anticipate a larger volume right. of customers, such as Fourth of July, it's right. always a big right. weekend in Charlton, for example. Right. They're going to work with the police staff in advance to make sure that there's details available. Okay. Great. Um, and then the other, what does the concert schedule look like in Charlton? I mean, I don't know what your. It's it's it generally is in the warmer months. It's it's a newer feature that's been yeah, provided in Charlton. Um, it, it's not going to be constant. Um, it's not like this is going to be five nights a week. There's going to be concerts, um, so it's it's periodic. So I think there was a concert was it two weeks ago, and there's one tonight. So um, they 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 will be steadier in the summer, right? Because that's when people tend to go to concerts. Um, but uh, but it's not going to be a constant. Um, Mark, will you also be addressing the stormwater management um, portion of the application? Sure. You want to address stormwater? Can I ask one more question? Sure. Sorry about that. No. So, with the legalization of marijuana in Massachusetts, what are what um, what's the protocol? What are your no smoking is allowed on the premises? Okay. At Any all. kind. Nothing. Nothing. Oh. No cigarettes. No. No cigarettes. Uh, this no. is a family-friendly no environment. And so there are staff members walking around the site at all times, one, to make sure that people are being respectful, uh -huh. right? Because alcohol is being consumed on the premises right. um, and to ensure that, they're, that their rules are being followed. And people aren't bringing their own. Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. Because it, it becomes a liability Absolutely. issue for Treehouse. So Treehouse is, um, is very careful in terms of how it serves. Mm -hmm. We discussed this with, with, the, with the select board, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are protocols that are put in place to ensure that folks that are you know, uh, intoxicated might show up at the premises, they're not being served, all the servers are TIP certified. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, safety is, is paramount for Treehouse. And unfortunately, and it's, it's what, five years of operations or more than that now. They haven't had one of those, you know, jam shop liability cases. Gotcha. So it, they take safety very, you know, they put it at the, at the at, 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 take it in the highest regard. So you want to speak about stormwater? Sure. Yeah, stormwater. So such a fun thing to talk about. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it, no. Well, it's very simple. Yes. So I don't really have to get into right. details. Um, like you would normally do if, if it was raw land and we were creating more impervious area and stormwater control. So it's a very basic stormwater port. And really, the reason that we can do that, that helps us um, without having to spend a lot of money in real estate um, on doing all of this stormwater stuff is the course pavement in that area, we can do it and it works, it helps us. And as I said, um, we actually reduce in phase two the, the amount of impervious by about 620 square feet or so. So really all of the, if you look at the plans um, in the existing conditions, you'll see the drainage systems and so forth. So, um, you know, there are really no calculations just by inspection you can say that with the reduction in, in impervious when we're increasing. We don't have to build a catch basin, right? It's all there. Even in the patio, which is depressed, there is drains in that patio that they'll reutilize. And, and it, like I said, it all goes to the stream. It'd be a little difficult to do that now. Um, you can still do it, but you'd have a lot more stuff that we'd have to do. So like when we go to phase three, there'll be more intense analysis because we'll be branching out more. But I do explain all of the 10 standards that are required in your co local code, but also in the Massachusetts um, Wetland Protection and Stormwater Act. And so you, you can see that there's the most important thing is the, is the um, is operation and maintenance of the forest pavement. And, and I'm having them, um, I'm asking them to clean out the catch basins uh, or at least inspect them four times a year. So you can see the forest. Who's the, who's the, who's the, who's the, is that at the, where's Jen? That's, no. who checks no. in with you guys? Um, well, it would be, I'm not sure who checks in with the town. 
Um, it's probably out of the building inspection department. What was the question? So the question is, this, these maintenance reports, right. I'm not really actually as concerned about this one for the very reason that Tony puts out there, but yeah. just to be very clear that the maintenance reports are then filed by you with right. the building inspector. I, I would think okay. that's the place they go because yeah. they're in the inspection department. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. So if it doesn't come in, then that my question is to yeah. us kind of how um, the yeah. schedule do we have that on? Yeah, and so there's actually the form that they can Xerox. It's only two check marks. They just yeah. need to go through and just keep that. It's almost like um, you know the construction sites that we have now at Over and Acre. You need to do do those kinds of reports and have them on record so that the town or the state or the federal guys come out. Look, you can you have your that your ongoing it's a living breathing document and it's continuing. So the big part, the things uh, that deal with forest pavement, you monitor, you know, just monitor it. You'll be able to tell if it's clogging up, if water's going to sit on it. It'll have drain, it'll have slope to it, because we want to do that. Um, clean the surface, power washing, just large particles, and vacuum. So they have these, you know, the big vacuum trucks, though, they can take up some of that and, and inspect the surface for deterioration. No winter sanding. Okay, so that's, that's important because it, it clogs the voids and that. Keep landscape areas maintained. Like I said, you don't want to have runoff from that slope, say if it gets the building draining into there, because the topsoil will clog it up. Never reseal or repave forest pavement, right? Because that would defeat the purpose. And then snowfall blades should have rollers or spaces underneath to keep it up slightly up the pavement um, so that you don't catch it and, and whack it. And then Is that the, one of the reasons people don't use it? This is the, one. the only thing that ever was complained to me, I haven't done it a lot because there's not a lot of this. We have, you know, some challenging areas that, you know, it doesn't go well when it's wet, like um, you have to bring in a lot of fill to be able to get it up above the water table. You can't put forest pavement in the water table. Right. It doesn't work. So that's a lot of challenges, especially in Deerfield because you got fairly high water table. Um, but you can you can bring it up and you can make it work that way. Um, it just, it's, it's, I would say that it's probably comparable to putting in all the underground storm drain systems and all of that. But if you can make this work, you don't chop up all the real estate to do all of that stuff right. and make it usable. So what we can do it, and that's what we're trying to do. I mean, why don't people use it? I don't know. Um, well, my other client didn't like that it scuffed. Doesn't like how it looked. He didn't like how it looked. But is the equipment to care for it more expensive than traditional? Not really. I don't. I don't think so because everything's been mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. you know, the trucks come into vacuum trucks just like they do the streets. They sweep it mm -hmm. and they vacuum it. And and then power washing that little area. I mean, it didn't make sense to do it in all the little areas because of walking, you don't want to do that. And um, that's why I did it in the important place so I could use the credits in that to be able to do the other stuff, which is traditional for ADA accessibility. Right. But didn't you say that it's not really good you know, for semis? Because oh yeah, no, I don't. I mean, other people may do it. I don't do it. I, I, I just, don't forget when we build that, we don't compact the subway. Like when you're building a road, you really compact mm -hmm. the subway. You put your stone, you compact all of that down, and then it gets tested to make sure it's at a compaction of 95% or more. And then you put your pavements down and you compact that. This we keep it loose. We don't want it to be mm -hmm. compacted heavy. So it's almost floating right then. It's it's a thicker pavement too. And you've got all of these stone layers from, from bank run to stone to choker small stone so that you're filtering through and you create a much like I said, typically you have like a road or parking, you're gonna have 18, 12 to 18 inches thick of a structural section. This thing's like 32 because all that other stone for the store of the water. And really doing the minimum, I mean, in a hundred year storm of that pavement, I'm only going to get three or four inches settling in that stone. So, um, yeah, it should work storm after storm. But we also have a sub drain in case it gets, you know, overtaxed for some reason. We have major, major storms, one right after another, like maybe July. Like <laughs> it, it will, it'll take, because we don't want it to get up into that pavement area and cause disruption. Mm, so. Thanks. Okay. Right. Thank you. I know I have one small question for you, Please. Mark, and then if there are any more questions with planning board, and we can mm -hmm. open up for questions from the public. Um, you talked oh, about yeah. the change from your phase one um, permit of a vestibule versus a portico. Can you say what the specific definitions of those two are here? Is what oh, so uh, so previously, Jay, can you go back to the slide? It's um, it's. It's going to be the building a or so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can kind of explain. So the vestibule itself is just the interior um, area where you walk in. So when you open the front door, cold air doesn't fly in, right? So it's like when you walk into any building. So that thing removed. So there, there was there was another vestibule that was already in there that's being removed. So um, 
Yeah. So if you can go farther down. So so what was previously proposed for the for the exterior alterations, it's really just modifying the doorways, to be honest with you. Uh, the the portico itself, you'll recall, was previously going to be a very large structure that was going to hang off the building. Right. And ultimately, in, con in, in consulting with the architect, it was determined that that a, a timber awning would be better for it for this particular site. So the best real estate saying the awning is basically an awning versus the portico. Yes, but I believe that there is a slight modification to this actual vestibule itself. Yeah, but it's a minor interior okay. alteration. All right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the planning board uh, or our planning board Zoom participants? Good. All right, so then perhaps we can open it up to questions from the public. Uh, Carolyn has her hand up, Carolyn. Hi, um, I just wanted to let, let you all know that the select board did, as Mark indicated, um, uh, approve a pouring license at our last meeting, as well as an entertainment license for um, phase one, two, and three. And um, this is, well, the second phase and phase three. Um, the only thing, the only comment that I had on any of their plans, and this is really related to phase three, so it really doesn't, um, is concerning, but I did want to bring it up because um, it would be part of their planning process to have outdoor plumbing is I would really like to see on the plans for phase three, the pad, at least the pad where you're going to put the outside bathrooms. Um, as, as Board of Health Chair, um, we would not be approving um, any kind of porta potty use or anything. And certainly, you know, with COVID moving ahead, you would want this this year, you would want to make sure there was plenty of um, hand washing stations and everything was sanitary. So um, just, it does not affect phase two tonight, but um, I would like to see um, the pad where the outdoor bathrooms were going to be planned for phase three, so that, um, you know, you, it would be indicative of, you know, planning for the plumbing and all that kind of stuff. Carolyn, um, as you talk about approving the entertainment license, um, does that work within the zoning as we're talking about, or do you have additional? Well, we're, we're, we're hoping, um, well, I'm hoping that the planning board would have a quorum and you would not mind meeting on um, August 23rd so that we'd have plenty of time before the October 4th special town meeting that we're planning um, to bring forward an overlay district that would encompass the ability to have entertainment. So the planning, the select board would be bringing that forward to the planning board. Yes, and I was hoping we would have planned. I guess Mark is gonna be out of the country on the first week in September. So it makes me a little nervous to wait till September. I would rather have us have plenty of time um, if, we, if a quorum is available on the 23rd. Thank you. All right, so we'll address that after we address this phase two. Okay. Uh, let's see, do we see any other hands from the public on uh, this phase two? I don't. I, uh, oh. Andrew, yes. Andrea. Andrea. Hi, I, sorry, I had to unmute. I'm wondering about um, sound levels. I think there was a discussion at the select board meeting about how loud the uh, um, concerts would be, since that is an outdoor area, maybe of concern to the planning board. Um, wonder if that can be addressed, please. Yes. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. I was gonna say they did a really well pre presentation at the select board meeting and that, again, um, that we work with the police department if there was any issues um, so that there would be immediate um, rec you know, correction. And Mark, that also goes back to when we were out in Charlton, I think I asked the questions or said, you know, can you define concert? So it's not going to be ACDC headbanging kind of music. Sure. When we were out there, just to let people know, it was pretty amazing. And we were out there midday and it was, you know, it was families with kids and dogs. And it was 
It was yeah. really welcoming. And that's and that's really the experience that we're looking for yeah. to provide in Deerfield. So um, to address um, um, just the, the question um, and also the issue or, or the topic generally, uh, as we indicated to the select board um, uh, last week, uh, Treehouse has retained a sound engineer to physically go to the property. So you'll recall, um, if you visited the site or you'll recall from the plans, um, the patio section of building C is the most southerly portion of the property. And then there is that ring of, of hardwoods that Tony was referencing before. In front of those hardwoods, um, Trias would, would um, uh, install temporarily speakers for an outdoor concert. Now, um, the concert would be a ticketed event. That would be a private event. Folks would have to buy tickets in advance um, the last one of the last shows that they they put on sold out in under sixty seconds. <laughs> um, so um, these are these are these are acts that people desperately would like to see. Um, but um, so what they did was they brought in professional grade audio equipment. They had the sound engineer test the sound levels um, in front of the speakers at the property line along five and ten at the veterinary clinic across the street and at the property line for the residential properties behind the speakers. So along the property line on five and 10, with, with the ongoing traffic, the decibel levels were 84 decibels, mm -hmm. which is pretty loud, right? It's a highway, so yeah. cars are, are tend to be pretty loud. When there was a gap in the vehicles and they, they, they played the sound, it actually tested 81 decibels. Mm -hmm. So it was actually lower at the property level than trucks driving by. Um, at the veterinary clinic, it was in the 50s. And then at the property line um, by the railroad, it was also in the 50s. So 50s, I'm told by the sound engineer, is like a country road. Um, it's, it, it's pretty pretty quiet. Yeah. I also had a question. I, I think someone had said that Pelican is pretty loud. So I mean, do you have any idea what the decibel level of Pelican is? We, we don't know what the decibel level. I don't think we actually did testing of, of their facility, but they're required to follow the um, the standards that are provided in the zoning bylaw. So um, that does allow for up to 64 decibels. Um, um, and the state regulations, DEP regulations are 10 decibels above ambient. So theoretically, if the ambient level along five and 10 is 84, technically we could go up to 94 and be in compliance with the DEP regulations. Quick question, yes. I don't know if it's not in place, but I'm thinking about the abutters and I, and I look at the abutter list and there's abutters that are not contiguous, right? They're not, they're, they're on side streets off of North Main Street and one's even on Hobby Lane. I'm kind of curious as to why they're classified as abutters. Is it a sound issue? So on the abutter list? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a geographic radius. Mm -hmm. So under okay. Massachusetts Law, it's 300 feet from, from the site. So and it's from it's from the contiguous property. So under Massachusetts law, even if you um, are all we're doing all of the activity on site in these particular parcels, this this one parcel, because they're all under common ownership, you have to provide notice to everyone who touches any contiguous parcel. So these folks down here got notice. These folks up here got notice. Well, there's really no one up there, but you know. Yeah, but even like Hobby Lane, that's what is the radius? It's three hundred feet. It's like a giant circle around mm -hmm. all the parcels. Hmm. Okay. Are there other questions either from the public or the planning board? So you're asking for two, two very two so, exceptions. So one is the scale, yes. mm -hmm. and the second is the trees. Yes. So. Yeah. So um, your green standards, which is yes. the new standard, yes. mm -hmm. um, requires that if you're going to remove trees. You have to list them in a separate schedule. Yeah. So it's, we don't have a separate schedule of all the trees, but what we have is all seven trees that are being removed with the dimensions of six trees. Excuse me, six trees. I'm not adding a tree on there. Should six trees. Six trees. I have that tree, not that. Six trees. Um, the dimensions are on the plan. So in lieu of providing a sheet with all the dimensions, uh, we're asking that the it just be included on the plan. Yes. Like That's thirty-six inch white pine. Right. It's it's it's, it's a technical part. Yeah. It's shown on the existing commission plan, and also labeled for your approval on the engineer grade. I, I think that the green standard, that particular green standard, would be much more applicable 
if you're doing a lot of Maybe, development right, or right. moving significant the scope of work included more trees actually mm -hmm. but so that being said you trigger it so that's yes. the standard we need to yes. request a waiver and then didn't you also say that uh parking you're wanting some um special parking no 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 parking compliance we're actually, fine. Right now, fine. We're actually we're have ample parking yeah. mm -hmm. right. okay. just out of curiosity what's the plan for the uh north field mm. Rose Yeah, that one. Well, it's a lot more wet than what It's super wet. No, yeah. So it cuts back on the amount of free parking that we can Yeah. So they're studying it. Yeah. So if you're going to talk, you have to come closer. <laughs> I, uh, it's to be determined. Yeah. So um, the, um, the question was what are we doing with the field? Um, north of the existing parking area. It's the old where the kids play soccer. Uh -huh. And I, my answer was that area is a lot wetter now um, than it was years ago. And I'm just looking at old wetland delineations to our new delineation. We delineated that this year um, between phase one and phase two, and it's gotten larger. So um, that means phase three parking in that area will be reduced considerably from what we had envisioned. So um, ultimately that will be parked in that area um, and a potential another access to five and 10 if we need it. But Jane will tell me. All right, so potentially if we don't have any more um, questions applicable to phase two, um, and it looks like we don't, could I have a motion to close the public hearing? I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you, Sylvester. Thank you, Kathy. I'll second that, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, thank you, Denise. Uh, any further discussion? <clears throat> all right, um, all those in favor of closing the public hearing? Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wichova, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. We've lost Ann Mary. Did we lose Ann Mary? <laughs> she was, yeah, she was having right. some difficulty. She was remote. So uh, six. Zero one. Zero one, I guess, yes. <laughs> zero zero. <laughs> yeah. uh, to close the public hearing. So deliberations among um, the planning board members for um, this proposal. Often we will deliberate, not often, we need to deliberate if there are any concerns about the uh, proposed scale and the proposed tree plan. And then also often um, we do consider whether or not we want to have any conditions. I just wanted to say it was it was extremely helpful going out doing our little road trip mm -hmm. to Charlton and I was duly impressed by that by the site and by everybody there and just everyone's welcoming. I mean Kimberly was great Mark. I mean everyone's great. And then again it was so helpful to then see you know do the site plan here. Um, so that when I was reading through the material, it made sense. So that was really helpful. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's really mm -hmm. important to really have the time to do that well. because this is a huge project. <laughs> and, you know, my, I, I, was I think it's just really well done. It was good <laughs> orientation. It was, it, was. it was really good orientation. Yeah. Do we have any um, comments or concerns among the planning board about the scale? Proposal um, of the phase two. I'm comfortable with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have no concerns. Okay. And how about the the tree plan? Um, I'm I'm going to stop there for just a second because I don't think it's like I'm kind of wondering: is it easy to do? Well, Wouldn't it be easy to do just to make a list? So, so uh, through the chair. Yes. Uh, yes. Technically, it's supposed to be done by um, a landscape architect. Yes. So it in involves engaging another professional to produce a list of the trees that are shown on, on, the, on the plan. I see for those six trees. Mm -hmm. Got so this is fair, but I think this is something that we want to really acknowledge because we just put this in. We had a lot of talk about it. It was of high concern. I think it's a perfect example of how we would waive this. But I also want to say that we just want to be very clear in the in the land of um, transparency that we we brought forward, you know, this um, bit of regulation. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we're not going to, because it is an extra cost mm -hmm. to the 
um, to the applicant, and it is minimal impact. So, which I, so I agree, but I think that understanding that where that tipping point is, so this has nothing to do with you guys. Totally agree with with the the um, condition, but I think that we want to think about that very clearly and moving forward. That. Um, what, at what point do we decide that? As a board, we say, okay, you know what? Sorry, suck it up. You gotta buy. It. You gotta buy yourself a landscape yeah. uh, or person to do it. So I, I think this one is so obvious, but I just want to say that I, I don't know when it would, when it's going to appear to us to be less obvious. So right. thank you, um, thank you, Rachel. Yes. 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 In terms of um, conditions, uh, we, I would like to hear the planning board's thoughts on having a condition that we have them bring back any substantial changes to phase two, if in fact, as they proceed, they look like there are going to be some changes. Sure. That's not very yeah. yeah. That's not very simple. And I think, yeah. Yeah. Anna Lee, that was very hard to hear. Can you say that oh, again, uh, please? Uh, but that Treehouse would bring any substantial changes to the site plan back to the planning board for further review. Okay. Thank you. Yes, for, for stage for phase two. Yes, yes. As determined I, for stage two, as determined by the building inspector, the building inspector's determination that there was a significant change to the plans in the enactment of this current plan, that we would then come back and um, review it. You know, the, the things that I think they've already mentioned, the portico change that might have been something that would trigger a concern on the part of the building inspector. I don't know. Um, but I think that we just thought that way. I think it'll look a lot nicer. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other uh, conditions that the planning board might want to consider for the application? I'm wondering if there is some way, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the conference scheduling again, and I'm just thinking that that would be a really good thing to, to kind of, uh, how do I say this, but like, um, have some, and this has nothing to do with us, really. This is Carolyn's business. So, I mean, this is a, like, how does it merge with the activity of the town? Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, yeah. Some other yeah, 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 yeah. Like, what, what is, so I, I don't know if that's really, doesn't that, that doesn't really fall under our purview, I guess. No. So forget it. What, what <laughs> Bring it back. Aside, I mean, I'm sure you're good neighbors and all that. Yeah, so, I, that, I mean, that's, that's what I would say is that, I think Treehouse has demonstrated to the town that it is a good neighbor by providing you know, storage for the schools, by uh, using the facility for, for vaccinations. Treehouse is at home in Deerfield and it feels very much welcome. So yep. thank you to all the elected officials, everyone for the reception. It's been nothing but stellar. Um, and so uh, that would certainly be receptive. Carolyn? I, I, I just wanted to say that um, we we do this, you know, we review the entertainment license every um, year and, um, you know, we were concerned about noise levels and all that kind of stuff. And so um, we, we, we feel like we're on top of it. And um, I think Treehouse certainly answered any of our concerns and our questions initially. Um, obviously, when they've been in operation for a year and we have some track record, we'll we'll be able to ask you know um, questions related to what they what they intend to do the next year. Right. Yeah, I just had one other thing. Thinking about it, I know that and forgive me, but who is which owner was at the site in Deerfield? Was that Nathan? No, that was Dean. That was Dean. Yeah. So he he's not on the call tonight. He's actually. Right. Running the concert in Charlton okay. tonight, okay. so he couldn't be available. Okay, wait, was he, is he at part only? He's one of the okay, members. okay, because we had a great conversation, and you know we were concerned. I think people were concerned about Berkshire Brew, and he said that they're you know they're only good friends and that they've had multiple conversations. So, and I know on your website, which I really appreciated, you know, um, talking about this Deerfield, talking about um, uh, Berkshire East. And I like to drink a lot of beer there, um, but you know, I, I'm just thinking: are are there any plans of doing any kind of group advertising or just ha ensuring that there's really good communication? I think it goes back to you know what's happening in the area and how can we all work together? Right. You know, maybe it's some group advertising to bring more people. Certainly, I, I think that the tree, Treehouse's vision for Deerfield is definitely tourism. Indefinitely making it a destination for folks. 
we obviously want to be cognizant of people going from one brewery to the next. So we need to have certain protections in place there. Um, but certainly encouraging folks to explore the area, to the area of restaurants. I believe Kim went to Berkshire and she's, she was friendly with them to begin with, but let them know before they even purchased the property. So it was, it was something that was discussed. Uh, he's definitely um, nurtured um, the owners of Treehouse um, and, and they certainly value that friendship. So I think it's definitely going to be a, an effort working with the, um, the, the Chamber of Commerce. I know there's been discussion with Jen about that, thinking about the number of tourists, how we can you know, potentially introduce, uh, you know, maybe if, 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 it, if, it, if there's a need or if there's a want, thinking about the bus routes and whatnot, there might be a way to um, really work as a cohesive community in terms of tourism. But mm -hmm. Deerfield's, the, the Treehouse's vision for Deer, Deerfield is really tourism and entertainment. And so um, it's going to, they're going to need to work with their neighbors. They're going to need to work with the town in order to kind of make this that destination. Right. So, mm -hmm. so right. there's definitely going to be that, co that coordination. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions um, from the planning board about uh, conditions, potential conditions? Right now, we only have one that has to do with substantial changes to the site plan that would come back. I, I, I just want to also go on and say thank you for the thorough traffic. Mm -hmm. I think the traffic yes. feature is one of the features that the uh, town, and I, I would encourage anyone who's listening um, to review the traffic study. Jane does a very nice job. And yes. um, there's no question that the traffic will increase. <laughs> so I think that that's why the traffic study is so important, just because anybody who has those concerns needs to see what it is that Jane's done in terms of. Um, you know, how she sees this managing potential for a second, you know, entrance, if that's something that seems to be really important down the road. Um, so I, I just, I think Deerfield needs to walk into this eyes wide open, knowing that, you know, we, we bear the Yankee candle traffic and we bear it successfully on that very straight road where traffic is, goes a little bit at a speed. We've all, all of us who live here know that that 50 mile zone, you get in there and you're like, ha ha. Um, but, you know, I think that at this point, this is a good spot for it because it will slow people down and have people tearing in and taking care at that point. So just uh, congratulations on that. Well done. And I think it's just important to note that it's going to be a lot more traffic. Yes. And that whole stretch right there from off the highway to past treehouse is evolving. Like that, that stretch yes. of five and ten is evolving and it's changing and it's becoming multi-lanes and there's on, off, yeah. left, right. It's, 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 you know, people need to be prepared, one, to change, and two, to accommodate. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Jennifer? I just want to say, um, this morning, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with the Franklin County um, Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, she has already visited with Treehouse and they've had great conversations and they're going to be moving to Old Deerfield, their offices, uh, so they'll be closer to, to us and all of our businesses. And just um, she wants to get together and have a meeting with Casey and, and uh, just talk about all of the uh, different businesses here and how we can promote Deerfield and Treehouse is definitely right there on the top. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, so our deliberations are concluded, and um, if I uh, could have a motion to accept the scale and the tree plan as proposed in the phase two plans with the condition that any substantial changes as determined by our building inspector uh, any substantial changes to the site plan are brought back to the planning board for further review. Okay. I'll make a motion to accept the scale as proposed and also the tree plan. And then if there are any substantial changes for the build, for the building inspector to buy the building inspector to, for you to come back to us. And here's a second. Oh, wait. Yeah. Here. <laughs> you have a second. You have a second. Sorry. I'll second it. Kathy, so best. Thank you, Kathy. Um, any further discussion? All right. Um, so uh, may we 
have a vote. Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Matropa, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. And it looks like we've lost, still lost. Yeah. And oh, and Emily Wolfco, yes. So, uh, <laughs> so lost the motion, very along the way. The motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Thank you all. Um, well, can re certainly related to that, the ZBA has requested comments um, from the planning board for their um, review of the of the proposal. And um, just as we received comments, <laughs> um, and in fact, there were no, um, there, were no comments. <laughs> there were no comments that we that we received. I mean, it was all no comments. So, um, do we have any discussion about uh, comments to just, give to the ZBA? Just very well done, and I encourage future applicants to be as well prepared as Teresa. Uh, right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we should have a, uh, a formal vote on note on, on our comments, the request for comments to, mm -hmm. yeah. to the, um, the ZBA. So I think it would be that uh, there would be no comments other than stating that we believe it was a well, well done proposal. Mm -hmm. Sir? We also have the storm water permit that needs to be approved. Yes. Okay. And the ONF and Carolyn has to up. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to bother you, but I think instead of saying you have no concerns or uh, no or there are no concerns, just say that you you are not concerned, you have no concerns um, at this point. I, I know when we don't do any comments, when we were saying no comments as a select board, people were um, getting concerned. So if you could vote that you had no concerns or nothing of concern um, related to the plans to the ZBA. I think it was helpful. That's why the select board was supposed to get back to you with comments and we had no comments other than, you know, the bathroom pads for phase three, you know, outdoor pads was my concern, but that was it. I mean, we, we had no concerns also. And I think it, it's very helpful to say you have no concerns versus no comment. Okay, thank you. Devil in the details. So may we have a motion to say that we have no concerns at this point and we believe it was a well done proposal. You also has, have approved it. So, I mean, <laughs> so you can say that. <laughs> okay, I, think but, I think it speaks for itself, but we well, appreciate positive feedback. Let's finish with this first. Uh, no comments, if you want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you, you move make a motion that we have no concerns with the CBA on the request for comments. Mm -hmm. uh, second? I second it. Kathy, Kathy Matroba. Oh, gosh. Can you write down who's doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say it nice and loudly, it comes yeah, through. Okay. 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 Um, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Ms. Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Matroba, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. And Emily Wolfco, yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. And um, then there's the approval of the um, farm water. Can I have a motion to approve the storm water permit. Permit, permit as outlined in the proposal for phase two? Motion. I make a motion to approve the stormwater permit as as, as um, talked about in the proposal. I second it, Kathy Sylvester. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, one thing that I just think the O and M the uh, the that contract not, again nothing to do with yours, but I think that we want to put it on some kind of schedule, the operations and management plan oh, right. that they that we want to put it on a schedule so that. We have, some, and again, not because of this particular, but that's just a good practice for us to do in any kind of uh, design is to make sure that we've got some schedule on that goes on. We've got that sugar of condos and just mm -hmm. kind of kept coming back. And we're like, whoa, whoa. you know, and they were, they, were, they were checking in with us, but we should be also ready for them to check in with them. So I would just say something for us to 
be more attentive to uh, from our very classic places. It's really evolving. Mm -hmm. That was part of our discussion, correct? Yes, that's our discussion. That's the discussion. I have about it. That's all. Thank you. Um, all right, may we have a vote? Ms. Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Mitchell, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. So we've got the uh, stormwater approved. And the final piece, I believe the final piece, is that um, there, it appears that the uh, applicant is requesting a entertainment overlay district zoning bylaw change, which would need to be well, ultimately hope they are hoping for it being voted on at the uh, special town meeting in October. Um, so as we're working on a time schedule with that, we would need to first review their application. Then at that meeting, we would vote for a public hearing and then need yeah. to go forward. So we're kind of on a tight time schedule. Yeah. So there's a question as to whether or not we would have a um, quarum on August 23rd. So do we meet, are we meeting with you, Carolyn? Is your, uh, is your board meeting the 23rd as well? Yes, the select board will be bringing forth the overlay district. So you're gonna bring that to us? Yes. And so then we review it and we'll, can we open the public hearing that night? No, we can't, we can't mm -hmm. open it. So we would then open a public hearing that for that. Got it, okay. Two weeks later. Got it. Right. Oh, I'm here. Um, yeah, I'm here. I have a conflict, but I'll see if I can make them just not sure. One conflict potentially, Andrea? I'm here. Okay. I will be there. I will be there. I will not be here anymore. <laughs> All right. So it appears right. that we will have a um, quorum. quorum. So we will have a meeting on. Um, well, uh, quick question. Is that a Zoom meeting? Right. Yes. Is that a Zoom meeting, uh, Carolyn? On the 23rd? Um, well, I was going to do it in person, but we could do it all Zoom. I think, unless we have all our equipment, I better, I, I would hope that. I think it's just better to do it in Zoom. You can hear, hear better, I think. So let's do it in Zoom. Can we decide that right now? Fine, I think. Is that yeah, good? I think we could. Jennifer, there isn't any reason if we post it as a Zoom, we could just do Zoom, right? That's correct. OK. Let's, let's just post it at Zoom, because I don't know if we're ever going to get this, You know, when our equipment is going to be in and then up and running. And it's a one event pony, right? That's all we're doing that night. Yes. I, I would not think that it was going to be a huge long meeting or hugely complicated. Well, there's a question of whether or not we could also have that as our public hearing for the select board select men. Oh, and um, then also, well, and I think that's all. OK, well, so two things. Yes. Right. Um, but potentially, they could see the all right. So, where are we here, guys? Um, we will have a meeting on October, tw October, August 23rd uh, to a uh, joint meeting with the select board uh, to, re to review, among potentially other things on our agen uh, agenda, a proposed entertainment zoning overlay district. Is that a six o'clock or seven o'clock? Seven. Seven. Oh, is it seven? Seven p.m. Carolyn or six? That's fine. Doesn't I, I think whatever works for you guys. I, I just am really apologize. You know, really thankful that you're accommodating. I, I'm just nervous about the timeline. That's all. So thank you so much. When they're at six, I can never remember. <laughs> <laughs> I usually just show up at seven. <laughs> Yeah, if it's at six, you're my favorite. And then, um, good. I think that's it for Treehouse, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank Thank you. You. What else do you guys want? Jeez, that was the worst. <laughs> no, <I am> like... <laughs> we'll see you. We'll see you August 25th. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.
Thank you all. Thank you all. Okay, good to see you all. Okay. Um, so, um, with apologies to Chris Curtis about reshuffled the agendas here, um, we have review of our. Um, it's uh, this way. Review of our um, solar bylaws so that we could then have a um, public hearing. August or September, but <laughs> whatever. And and actually, as Chris is coming up here, um, we can't forget we do need to have a vote for the public hearing for the select board selectmen on August twenty third. So when Chris is done, um, be sure to remember to do that. Remember to do that. I got it. Okay, Chris. Is this Chris back for me? Ah, uh, you're gonna have to really stand up. Any bit more. Stand up. Yeah. Okay. So Mike, you can actually probably sit, but you have to sit closer to yeah. the mic is up there. So, uh, yeah. so you yeah. All right. Well, it's nice to see you all in person. Nice to see you. Yeah, I know it. Um, so we're here to talk about um, some amendments to the solar um, energy bylaw. There are a number of comments that came up during the course of the adoption of the bylaw and various meetings with the finance committee, public hearing, town meeting. Annalee did a really outstanding job of putting all of those comments together and summarizing them all. And um, I think we have addressed all of those comments in these um, revisions. Most of the comments had something to do with either size of the system, height, or dimensional requirements. Those were the, the, the big issues that came up. There were some other minor things. Um, <laughs> I want to try to address um, each of those um, first. So one of the big questions was um, the size of, of small scale systems. And we had originally put a 10,000 square foot maximum on those into the bylaw. Um, that was the subject of a lot of uh, discussion. The revisions that um, we have before you tonight would reduce that number to 2,100 square feet. And that number is uh, based on a recommendation from a solar practices guide that was put together by Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in cooperation with eight or nine other communities in the valley here, where they did some pretty extensive research and they brought in um, consultants and so forth to, to look at um, a model bylaw. So I think it's a fairly well researched number and it's one that's been used by other communities. The other thing that um, came up as a really substantive issue was um, height of systems and the dimensional requirements for small scale solar systems. And to make sure that we were really clear about what those numbers were, what I've done is added two additional tables of dimensional requirements to the bylaw that really sort of spell all of this out so we don't have to search around through the text to try to find it. Um, so you see those um, in the table section. I'm looking at number. It's the sixth page of the bylaw. Oh, but I have it on my I'm just looking for it like. Oh yeah, we did. I think you go ahead and talk. And I'll keep talking. I just want to. I can make a copy, so I'm okay. I'm like searching it up on my phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> So we have a table of uh, dimensional requirements for small scale ground mounted systems. And that, that the dimensional requirements in that table are exactly the same dimensional requirements as exist in the current zoning bylaw for all uses. So although the bylaw previously said that that's what the dimensional requirements were, we put this table in just to make it absolutely clear that it's the same requirements that any other use um, would have. So for example, in the RA district, the front setback is 30 feet, rear yard is 10 feet, side yard is 10 feet, and maximum height uh, is 15. Uh, now the height is the only thing that's different from other types of uses. So for small scale um, ground mountain systems, we're suggesting that the maximum height is 15 feet. Uh, we are also suggesting that same height 
requirement. For, oh, in all districts. In all districts. Yep, I see it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the table just above that, yep. the table of uh, dimensional requirements for medium and large scale ground mounted uh, solar it's energy also. systems, it's also 15 mm -hmm. feet there. Bylaw um, that was adopted had 35 feet in it. Mm -hmm. I, I took a kind of close look at this and I actually walked, went around and looked at some of the larger scale systems, for example, the one on Set Right Road. Mm -hmm. They're about 10 feet tall. Um, Many of the other ones that I looked at were in that same range. So I think 15 is completely Ample. reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, Ample and not 30 bucks. Yeah. It's, it starts to be another problem. Right. <laughs> so the but third. So right, that's a perfect example because they were, you know, that yeah. we tried to keep that very low for the butters. They were not eager to look out over the lot. Right. And it's worked out pretty well. But yeah. Know, I think that's a very good, you know, successful. I've Sorry for the butters, but I think that would get very used to it. So, yeah, it is you know, pretty hard to see actually yeah. from the road for the yeah. most part. So, the third table is a table of, of dimensional requirements for roof mounted systems. And the only requirement here is, is the maximum height. And there was a lot of discussion about roof mounted systems and how, how high we could go. What we uh, wound up with was. Um, for residential, 37 feet. That's based on the current height limitation is 35 feet for a structure. So only allowing uh, an additional two feet to accommodate the, the solar panels rather than a larger number. And then for the other districts, um, most of the commercial industrial districts, the number is 39 feet. That's based on the understanding that there might be a flat roof involved. So if you have a, you know, let's say a system set at a 45 degree angle and it's an eight foot panel having adding an additional four feet um, to allow for that, that type of a panel to go onto a flat roof. That's how we came up with the 39 feet. And then the EPD district, the existing um, height requirement is 48 feet for structures. So we again added four feet to that. So the total maximum height with solar panels is 52 feet. So the, the C, CBR, I mean, the central village, it's two, uh, just two feet higher because I'm confused. Because that's um, commercial and so a commercial building flat. might have a flat roof, okay. whereas most residential structures are going to have um, the, right, the you know, two of the roof. That makes sense. Okay, so those are like the fundamental biggest issues. I, I want to just kind of take you through really quickly some of the other changes, um, starting with um, the definitions. In the definition of as of right siting, we made some changes to make it clear that the, the types of uses that include as of right siting are small scale ground mounted systems roof mounted systems, passive solar energy systems, solar canopies, and municipal solar energy systems. All of those are as of right. Just go through this again. So roof systems are there. Small scale, ground small mounted, scale ground. roof mounted, passive, yeah. solar canopies, and municipal energy systems, solar energy systems. Um, the other uses, um, and this is all reflected in the, in the changes to the, to the use regulation table on the last page of the bylaw. Um, it, it, it sort of reiterates all of this information, but just to make it clear where each of these uses stands. Um, medium scale ground mounted systems are uh, allowed by right as well, but they're allowed by right with site plan review. So that's, that's shown as a yes F. with yeah. two yeah. What's the next so, so I'm sorry, this is a question from Andrea. Um, so you, you said as of right development may be subject to site plan review. Is that because of the size? Only the medium and large would be subject to that? Not, the small would not? That's correct. Correct. 
Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Um, what is an example of a passive solar energy system? Passive solar system is basically utilizing the sun to warm the house by sunlight coming through the windows of the house and being absorbed into the, the home itself, usually with a concrete floor that acts as an absorbing mechanism. But it's basically just orienting the house to the south, with lots of glass on the south. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's like architectural design. Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, in the, in the definition section, um, we've changed the definition of medium scale ground mounted. Just the only change there is, is the number um, at the bottom end of, the, of that um, use. So it's medium scale goes from 2,100 square feet of surface area up to five acres. And then that again reflects the change in the small scale, which goes up to 2,100 square feet. Um, let's see. Other changes that we made. There are some deletions um, on the fourth and fifth pages, and the seventh page, I guess. Some of these are, are language from the original solar bylaw that we felt was just unnecessary and actually kind of confusing. Um, because we now have these tables of dimensional regulations that make, lay out everything really cleanly and clearly, it's not necessary to have language trying to describe that in terms of setbacks and so forth. So it's, I think best to just take that out altogether. Mm -hmm. And then starting in section 3870 and kind of going through to the end of the bylaw, there are, 3870 is design and performance standards. And then um, 3880 is safety and environmental standards. 3890 is monitoring, maintenance, and reporting. 3895 is abandonment and decommissioning. For each of those sections, we thought it would be important to make it clear which of the types of solar systems these standards apply to. So you'll see just a sentence at the beginning of each of those sections. And for example, the design and performance standards apply to just the medium and large scale ground mounted systems and the medium and large scale roof mounted systems. So in other words, if you're putting a small scale system on, on your home, you don't have to comply with design and performance standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a. May I ask another question? In thirty-eight seventy-five, um, under control of vegetation, the, it says mowing or the use of pervious pavers or geotextile materials underneath the solar array is a possible alternative. Would we want to change "possible" to "recommended"? Sure. Oh, I. I, I yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, I think that, yeah. especially in light of our conversation about. Great, right. pervious papers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Nice. Good catch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, is that um, pretty much a review? I think I've captured most of the, the changes. Mm -hmm. So again, our um, our review right now is to feel comfortable enough with this that we could vote for it to go forward to our uh, public meeting. Initially, we had talked about that being on September 11th. Um, May I ask one more question? I'm so sorry. Um, in 3895, when we were talking about abandonment, how do we know when something has been abandoned? <laughs> You know, it, a, a year with no occupy. I, I just didn't know how to, you know, but how to quantify. You know, this is you make a really strong point because this is once again at the operation for management contract. You know, uh, plan that we want to be sure, and maybe we put that in uh, for a large scale. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think because I know, for instance, the one that we approved up on Keats Road, the Warner property. Mm -hmm. They, we have a plan oh. with them, an operations management plan.
plan with them, but I don't know if I can. No, actually, um, the problem with that is that they the ownership has changed, and we're having a hard time finding getting who the, new, who the new owners are, so we can get the the plan. Maybe so there you go. Yeah. So enforcement is always an issue. That's that's the big issue, and so maybe we do want to have some. Yeah, Lake Shore is not being coming forward. It's challenging but don't we have money to yeah, so. from them for a bit yeah yeah, yeah we do we yeah do. but so. that's super important in the well, I think and we may want to put that into our regulations so that any future planning board is very clear on where would that go chris i have 38.95 is about abandonment or decommissioning financial security surety it's in here mm -hmm. so to, to answer Andrew's original question yeah. If a, if a system fails to operate for more than a year, um, that's considered abandoned. Okay. Is that in here somewhere? Yes, it's 38951. Yeah, oh, I see. If it fails to operate, okay. Thank you. And so that's the okay. definition of abandonment, not as per se the definition of abandonment, where it's just less than attended to. No, it has to do with not functioning. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the issue true. around operation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But how, well, how is the question though? It's a good question. <laughs> now, it, in, the, in many cases, they're going to decommission the system like that. So there's reference to that in, in this language as well. Mm -hmm. um, but in case that didn't happen, uh, I guess you know you'd probably find out from the from the uh, power company. Mm -hmm. But they have they have no obligation to run the plans. Yeah. No. They yeah. might have to And I mean, ultimately, okay. So if somebody so like Lake Shore walks away. They sold it. They walk away. The next people walk away. It doesn't work for a year. We do have the financial surety that we set up the escrow account. So then the town doesn't bear the cost of right. decommissioning that. Right. So ultimately, that's just why that whatever it is that I'm looking at, I saw it two seconds ago, 38.4 is really important for these large scale. Yeah. Yes. And and I think we I think we feel like we did a decent job. Now here's the problem is that uh, with the, the Lakeshore project. Mm -hmm. But this is an interesting wrinkle that we don't know who who is mm -hmm. running it, who's, who's operating the pop shop now. Mm -hmm. Chris, would that mean that we would yeah. need in that section 3890? I don't know if we need 3895, but uh, change of ownership should be reported to the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually, mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. makes good sense. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. So, the financial surety shall be maintained by the developer for the lifespan of the facility. Can't hear you. Sorry, she is muttering. <laughs> well, well, it says with the <laughs> annual certification notices from the surety company. So, where are these annual certification that notices? From, that comes from the bank. That's those people okay. are on their job. Yeah, yeah, they're they're sitting on some money. And yeah. They, and right. so, like losing track of that money. Thanks. Sure. Are there any other um, questions or suggestions? No, no, I do have a question. So, okay, so the useful lifetime of a lot of these installations is what about 20 years? Is that correct? Okay. So, okay. so what happens? Mm -hmm. Dollars, you know, what is the to, for the decommissioning. So is that sort of prorated to look ahead 20 years as to how much that might cost? That's the job of the planning board to do that. That's mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. People are on the corner enough. Uh, and that's yeah. So is is there a list of all of the solar systems in town? I'm and sorry. Sorry. Nine five four A. It says the amount. This is referring to the amount of the, the cost estimating process. The amount shall include an escalator for calculating increase or mm -hmm. net cost due to inflation. Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. about COVID and the escalating prices of lumber <laughs> and other, other materials. Sure. Yeah. It's more just pointing it out. Yeah. And yeah. like the disposal charge. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. You ready for my question? So my question is, you know, if we if we know that they last about twenty years, do we have a list of all the solar um, uh, is installations in town with the date <laughs> when they started? And so at least it would give us a sense of. I mean, does the building inspector have something like that? It would give us a sense of okay, uh, we got to check and see if this is still working. I don't. I just. I don't know. Well, that's where we have a, a request for an annual report from the large scale solar people, and we have not received the annual reports, and so we are working since, since the since it well since, right since it well I don't think we received it for the second year. No, and who, yeah, so yeah, who polices that? I mean, how do we? Oh, it's not. Oh, hold on. May I speak? Yes. Okay. So it's not policing. It's the um, policing. I'm sorry. Inspector is um, um, he's the code enforcement officer. So if there's any special permit that has certain conditions, um, then he would be, you know, checking on it and saying that they're not in compliance with the special permit or the site plan review or whatever. And. Okay. You know, we reporting back to so that they had something to show, you know, that they needed to follow up. So, um, this is something that I worked on the other uh, in my previous employment town is is um, making uh, lists and putting it on calendars of of you know all the special permits that have certain conditions that need to be followed up on periodically, um, such as maintenance. Okay. Right. Hmm. Any other? Um, these are good, good catches uh, and good um, suggestions. Anything else? Hmm. No. So, I have a question. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Yeah, a, a couple of things with the, the small scale. Uh, if this is by right and there's no site plan review, does this apply as far as decommissioning on the small scale uh, solar systems? As far as how are homeowners going to be required to put away X amount of dollars a year to decommission their solar systems after 20, 25 years? No. I don't think so, Jeff, because ultimately that's a property value of the of the that's the homeowner's risk that they take and then the next purchaser the next buyer comes in and they have to decide if they want this defunct you know solar installation um but okay. the i i understand that so you're saying it, it just whatever happens happens no big deal but then what recourse does a neighbor have when you have a ground mount solar system of 2,100 square feet or up to 2,100 square feet that's fallen apart and is no longer in use. And it's basically turns into a major eyesore for the neighbors. Sculpture. What recourse, what recourse do they have, if any, besides going to court? Well, it's got to kind of fall into that same, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think it probably, it's got to fall into that same category of the dilapidated barn sure. that your neighbor has that's tipping over and looks like, you know, uh, you know, not to be, looks bad. <laughs> and, uh, and there you are stuck with it. Because I do think, I, I do think people who put this investment into this, um, have to figure that it, it's got some payback down the road. So they're not going to leave it off, but the market will, will be the pressure point for the individual homeowner. Yeah. See, so I, 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 I disagree. I, I see that these solar, some of these solar systems, especially the ground mounts could fall in disarray and have a negative effect on neighbors. Uh, I'm also a little concerned about the square footage as far as the 2,100 square feet. 
uh, you know, in some of the lots, we're talking quarter acre lots, half acre lots and that. And I, I support roof mounts as far as on, on the, especially on smaller uh, individual houses, as far as residential for a small square, a small scale. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see something, you know, something to the effect of a, a lot size. If you're under uh, an acre lot, then it has to be roof mount. If you're over an acre lot, then you, you do the square footage. I also think that the 10 feet, as far as setback on the sidelines and that, are, are very tight as far as neighbors. Uh, you know, let's face it, some people are very pro uh, solar and there's some people that are not. And as I've stated before, some ground mounts aren't that attractive. Aren't attractive. Let me put it that way. Roof mounts, they've done some great work, some beautiful work with roof mounts and that. So I myself see where, especially where there's not a site plan review, there's by right and there's no plan for decommissioning of these solar and these uh, ground mounts can be so close to other uh, neighboring properties. I see it as a, as an issue. And, you know, I thank you. I thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. The, the setbacks. Okay. So the setbacks are similar to, again, back to the dilapidated barn. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, and it is a matter of what people are getting. Or, yeah. yeah. It's okay. the same as any other structure. Any other structure. So, okay. so I think that that, I agree with you. And I, I do think that we're talking about something where, People are going to have are getting used to a, a certain a look that is causing some people more concern than others. Chris, you also mentioned, and then you sorry that this that these um, requirements are based on, or some of them, this in particular, twenty one hundred square feet is based on the um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission best practices. Do you know of any other? Um, ways of going about that, that going about. Uh, you know, differences rather than 2100. Uh, Jeff is saying, Yeah, that's a lot. That feels like a lot. Or also, Jeff, you're kind of proposing to the idea of like proportional to the lot. So somebody has a big property, that's what you're thinking, or right? That's that's correct. That is that is my point. If it's you know, when you get on some of these smaller lots in town and you take a look, if you're a quarter acre lot and all of a sudden somebody's going to try to put on a, you know, major up to 2,100 square feet. I mean, 2,100 square feet, you're looking at what? 10 by 200 roughly. That's, that's a huge, that's a huge round field. So and, and. I, I'm just concerned about if it was more appropriate to the lot size, and if your setbacks were a little bit further. Uh, I just I just feel that there's a lot of people that put a lot of money investment in their properties and that into it, you know, to have a situation where somebody simply has a right to be within ten feet of your property line and put up 200, I mean, 2,100 square feet of solar panel with no requirements to maintain it, no requirements to have money to decommission it. I, I just feel that that's an infringement on, on the existing property owners. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yes, I, I, you know, like I say, I'm not, I'm not against the roof mount. Some of the roof mounts are beautifully done. Okay. The, the ground mounts, though, the majority of the ground mounts that I have seen just are not that attractive. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm just worried about how the impact of the neighborhood. Thank you, Jeff. We okay. understand. So, so, so I have a question, Chris. Okay. So, and you may not know the answer, but this, okay, I've got a comment and a question. First of all, 
if I were going to, you know, as a potential homework, which I already am, if I, if I was changing and I saw that, it's sort of like, hey, how, how many years, what's the useful lifetime of the roof, which is typically about 20, unless you have a metal roof and that's, you know, 35 or more. As I would ask that question before I bought the place, and if I didn't want it, or if they said it was you know, near the end of the useful lifetime, that I would put in the purchase and sale agreement. So that's number one. I think you know, that you have to be a savvy consumer. Secondly, is do you have any idea what the percentage is of people doing ground mounted as opposed to roof mounted? And what is the advantage? And yeah. what is the cost differential? Oh, so let me address that comment, but also okay. um, Jeff's comment. Um, I'm going through the process of putting solar on my house right now. Okay. So I, I have some experience yeah. with this working with companies. And first of all, you would not have a 2,100 square foot residential ground mounted system in, in almost any case that I can think of. And the reason for that is that you can, you can only really make use of the amount of solar energy that's consumed by your home. Mm -hmm. So in my case, you know, I don't use a lot of electricity to get in with. I can only put nine panels on my house and it'll, it'll meet all of the, the, the needs for the entire electrical use mm -hmm. of the home. Nice. A bigger family of four or five might have more like 18 panels, you know, maximum. Mm -hmm. But so we're still talking about a, a system that's under, you know, well under a thousand square feet. It's probably more like 600 to 800 square feet. Right. The reason you wouldn't put more than that on or on the ground in your backyard is that you can't use the power. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use the power, the only thing that you can get for that is a credit on your electrical bill. Okay. And why would you want a credit on your electrical when, bill when you're paying for the entire electrical usage mm -hmm. with your solar system? So that credit is of no use to you. In other words, there's no financial reason why anybody would build a 21 square, 2100 square foot residential solar system. The reason that it's in the bylaw is that there might be small businesses that would do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that so in, in your commercial zones, you, you might have higher usages um, and a small scale mm -hmm. system for a business could, could be okay. that size, but not in someone's backyard. So then why um, would a residential, why would someone in a residential area choose to put a ground mounted as opposed to a roof mounted? So sometimes they move. <laughs> The, you can, okay. the principal reason is probably because the roof isn't oriented mm -hmm. to the right. south. Okay. Uh, okay. So you want your panels to be, have maximum absorption. Mm -hmm. Another reason might be there's trees in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to move it okay. to a site that's got more solar access um, on the property. Um, in some cases, people might not like the, you know, the, the look of it on the roof for some reason, and they might want it on the ground mm -hmm. because they have more space on the ground. Okay. Um, there could be various reasons, but I think primarily it's, it's going to be, you know, good solar access is, mm -hmm. is the reason why you would want to do that. So maybe if we had a, per, a special permit <clears throat> attached to it, that would help. It would be a very easy to sort through the businesses versus, and it would give people like who are concerned about this somehow as like that's a lot of explanation that. That makes a ton of sense right here, mm -hmm. but it's not evident in the bylaw. So, right. is it worth putting a special permit there just so that it's allowed and, and it's you know encouraged at that like yeah. a cutoff point so that yeah. so that yes, it's so uh, because you know shoot, I just lost it. Um, in RA could be a farm. Mm -hmm. In uh, Central Village, I guess it could be a business. I, I mean, that's very highly unlikely. Maybe not the, the most unlikely right. in the in the zone, but C one and C two, it's very possible. Well, can I just yeah, yeah, quickly yeah. respond to that? I, I guess if, if I were going to go that route, yeah. I would I would um, in the table of use regulations right yeah. now, the medium scale uses are. I said plan with you. Anyway. Um, so this, if you were going to up the ante for small scale ground map, yeah. it would be site plan with you, not special. Permit. Sorry, I meant site plan with you. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Site okay. plan with you, not special. Permit. Okay. So you're yeah. saying special permit for small scale? No. 
yeah. site, site plan review SPR. for small scale ground mounted. That's, that's what Rachel that's said. That's trying to interpret. Just a little yes, it is after nine o'clock. <laughs> but just for ground mounted. So just for ground mounted, yeah. not so that yeah. it wasn't a buy right. That's all. Did you take that? It, um, does, it does add to the cost um, for the yes. one that wants to do that. Yeah. Jennifer? Hi, I was just going to say what Chris just said. We're talking about sort of business friendly, family friendly, using solar energy and making somebody come for a you know, site plan review for their single family home. I, I feel is excessive and it's the amount of paperwork, time, engineering. When I'm not talking about all of them. I'm saying have a, a cutoff point that is, so it's not, it's not the current size. Like, I, I guess I'm just, your explanation just now, so I'm just trying to address your explanation right now makes totally mm -hmm. total sense. And and I know, like, we tried to get on the grid of deal book, we couldn't, uh, Eversource does not want to play with anybody. Right. So nobody's really going to get any kind of transmittal, like, where they can sell power. <laughs> it's, the, it's just that, it's you just can give it away. You can give it away. Yeah. 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 So, so there you go. So invest a whole lot of money so you can give Eversource more. No, I mean, you can give it to your neighbor. I oh. actually buy solar power from my neighbor. I have solar so panels and I thing. buy more from Patty. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do that. I just, I, I guess there um, is there, it, it is a big space. Like yeah. to just point for somebody to, to build a house, you're, you're waiting in a neighborhood, you're waiting for somebody to build a barn, <laughs> I guess. But you're not necessarily, I think it's, I saw what we ran into at Set Right Road. The Set Right Road people did not, really did not love the idea. If that, if, if Ostrowski had decided to put up a barn right there, mm. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have moved. Yeah. They wouldn't have moved. Mm. But they were really set off by the sight of something that's very, um, you know, alien. And as people get used to it, mm -hmm. and you know you drive by the center and you sit there and you're like, you drive by it without any problem. You know, our first couple of times you go by like, mm -hmm. um, so I, I just wonder if size-wise, like that size, if, if there's if that's a concern that we want to cons consider anyway, mm -hmm. is is size, and then that we move to it. And I appreciate Jen's point, like a family. So your neighbor we buy from, how big is their so it's, it's a, not big. It's She's just a single person who puts solar panels on her roof. So you, you from the roof, but you see how that might be somebody says, Ooh, if I do yes. the larger scale, yeah, right. then I, then I mm -hmm. could prop it up. Well, you, could, uh, you could, but you really aren't selling it. You're, you're having to gift it to someone like one person. You can't gift it to, you know, you tell Eversource, I want 50% of my excess or whatever it is goes to, my neighbor. goes to this person who's on Eversource grid. Right. And then, you know, you yeah. can ask them to pay you, but Eversource isn't getting involved in that. But you see where I'm saying, like, that's, that starts to be something else altogether. Business. It's you a little risky it. business if you think you're going to make money because you don't know that anybody's right. going to buy it from you. I think it's you not, not that... Point? I don't think <laughs> I, I don't think it's likely yeah. to happen. I think that's pretty big stretch because you have to pay for those panels. No, absolutely. So and then you're expecting to sell that energy to a neighbor who's kind enough to want to buy. I just don't think that people are going to do that. I, I don't disagree. I, yeah, I don't disagree with you. But, uh, well, so, they would, but may I, they're not. May I make a comment? It's a little bit of a briefly, briefly, Jeff, yeah. and then we do yeah. need to. Sorry. Um, we do may I make two comments, please? I'm sorry, I'm trying to raise my hand, but it's not allowing me to do that. Uh, and what Kathy was talking about, that's a point that I wanted to bring up. My understanding of it with Eversource is if you, if you uh, earn a credit, you can, uh, so you can earn more or generate more solar than what you can use, but you can gift it. Like you could gift it to a family member or something is my understanding, uh, if, if that's right. And Kathy alluded to, you could give it to your neighbor or whatever. Yeah. My, uh, my other concern though, and I hope people you know, understand this from where it's coming from. As I said, 
a lot of people put a lot of time and energy into their properties. And a lot of people spend a lot of time and energy maintaining their properties. And if you have a neighbor that puts up a, a ground mount solar system and basically neglects it, and, and I'm sure you've all seen this, some people maintain really well, other people don't. And all of a sudden you decide to put your house up for sale five, 10 years down the road and you've got a you've got a, a ground mounted solar system that is not too appealing next door that's going to impact your property value and that's going to impact your sales potential that's like taking two old junk cars and having them stuck in the yard next to you and there's nothing you can do about it and that's going to impact you as far as a homeowner and your potential and Thank you know, I, I built, you know, I built for the industry for years. This is not a pipe dream. This is a reality of what I'm talking about. Thank you, Jeff. Jennifer, did you have a point? And then um, let's see what we can do to see where we're going. Well, my point was, is that it's 917 right, and right. we're way, way past. I've been here since 8 a.m. So. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. Continue it or, yeah. Thank you. No. I think the main area of question is whether or not we might be looking at different um, requirements for ground mounted residential uh, solar installations. Um, we do have a precedent that it seems that the that in general, what we have stated here is a, um, a guide that is found in many Pioneer Valley bylaws. Yeah. Um, so the question would be whether or not we want to try to debate this some more prior at, at potentially our August 23rd meeting or bring these forward for more uh, public comment at the September 11th um, meeting when we would have a public hearing. I think those are our options. If we do it September 11th, we won't. It won't have time to get on the um, warrant for the special town meeting, will it? Uh, if in fact there aren't, uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a month. Yeah. September 11th, October. Uh, right. In terms of changes, if the if the changes are um, substantive, then we would need to have another public hearing right. prior to October 4th, which yeah, we yeah. could do. Which we could do. I thought you had to get it in three weeks before. Two weeks. Okay, two, two weeks. weeks. And it's, three weeks. it's about substantive changes. It's not like, I mean, if we, you right. know, but this is substantive. I do think we want to, I, I mean, I just want to explore it a little bit because I just feel like that explanation as clear as you've made it, isn't clear in the bylaws. And I just wonder, you know, it is a large, it, it, that fear is significant and it is a large attack of the bulk yields mm -hmm. next year, <coughs> your residents, potentially. And, and I don't think it should be pinned on a ratio. I think that's, that's discriminatory. But, but I do think that it, you know, I don't think it makes sense, I agree. But is there some way that we can make some kind of discrimination where at a certain setup point there is a, a well, one way to address that is to change the number again. Yeah, yeah, right. From 2,100 square feet to something smaller. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. then the other ones fall into the medium scale, they go through site plan review. Yeah. But you still have a buy right option for yes. a very small scale yes. homeowners. So, so, so do you scale. know like the average size I square can, footage? I can easily find yeah, out. that yeah. might really help. That way. I'd say it's probably more than six to eight hundred mm. square foot. So if we like a thousand to go on the large end of I, that, I, I can get that number. In. That would if you, you wanted know, to consider that. Just can, be family perfect. friendly and also address. Uh, Jeff's right. concern that is yeah. a valid concern. Oh. Jen? Yes. No. I mean, 
you sort of some I think Rachel said it or somebody said it a little while ago, um, having it being uh, that size on a roof or an existing structure under the small scale is as of right, but have a different number for ground mounted that's smaller. Would, would that work, Chris? Well, roof mounted is, is, is as of right no matter what no size. No matter what. Yeah, so just having a different size for ground mounted on for the small scale. That's what I was just suggesting. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what we're yeah. yeah, so, but, but, but then, okay. I'm just saying, because then it pushes it so that somebody who has a single family house that wants a ground mounted becomes a medium sized solar. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying that we could we could reduce the number even further from 2100 square feet down to say 1000 square feet. But anything from 1000 on would be medium or large. Medium scale. Medium and then, scale. And then you'd have site plan review kick in for that and all the other provisions for medium scale that are in the bylaw. So that would still give us a chance to have some by right residential ground mounted that doesn't have to go through site plan review because I think that's really an onerous process for most homeowners to, to try to deal with. It's a lot. It's a lot of you know conditions. It's the meetings. It's you're talking um, depending on the caseload and when planning board has meetings. It's a three to six month process because not only do you have to make the meeting, then you go to the meeting, then you write the decision, then you file a decision to 21 days. You know, it, it's a long time for somebody that's just wanting to, you know. All right, well, let's do this. Our, how does this sound to the planning board? Is that um, Chris can mull over and find, think a little bit more about changing the number for the ground mounted resident small scale solar. We will discuss that uh, at our, uh, our, our 23rd meeting, which then would still give us the two weeks notice to be able to have our public hearing on um, okay. the 11th. Okay. Yes. Excellent, excellent. I'm supposed to remind you of something. What was I uh, Select board, select men, yes. um, yeah. that we would vote. So, but wait, yes, so yes, would right. I settle on this? Yes, yes. So there's, so there's three changes, just to make sure we're clear from, from the draft that I presented. And, um, and those are the change in the number, the 2,100 square feet. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. We have to that's going to be. In 3875, um, we, we changed the word possible to recommended. Yes. And uh, 3895, we said the change of ownership shall be, shall be reported to yes. the yes. council. Yes. So I just want to make sure that you're yes, all clear yes, that yes, that's right. what mm -hmm. we would mm -hmm. then be presenting. All right, just for clarification, the meeting's on the 13th, it wasn't a Saturday. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Well, no, I'm just, I'm just saying, you want to something? All right. Got it. I had it on the 13th. two minutes to talk about before the plan. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. And this we also. Very, very short. Now. Yes, yes. We also have coming to town meeting on, uh, town, town meeting is there's a very small, uh, technical change that we need to have on the floodplain bylaws. So I don't know if you have seen this, but mm -hmm. basically um, right now the floodplain bylaw has a reference mm -hmm. to the state building code. And it turns out that that number in the state building code that's referenced has changed since the bylaw got adopted. So there's a, it says the language is, it has to be consistent with the requirements of the Massachusetts State Building Code pertaining to construction in the floodplain, parentheses, currently section 744. So then um, you have to go, the, the, they have to go to the state one and check that. So we don't put the number in. Yeah, so we, we shouldn't have put the number in, in there the in the first, first place. So we wanna just put mm -hmm. words currently section 744. And that's okay. the only thing. Just take it out. Sounds good. So we do need to have a public hearing on that. Excellent. And that. So, um, can we have a vote to have a public hearing on floodplain review and, and the select board select men at our 23rd. August 23rd Perfect. meeting? Yeah. August 23rd meeting, yes. Do we need to vote on that? Yes. Okay, so I Sorry. propose that we have open public hearing 
for both the amendment to the floodplain uh, bylaw and the uh, change of language from select board or selectman to select board that we have those two public hearings on the 23rd of August. I second, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> we all second it. Yes. Yeah, we are totally in. Okay. Uh, <coughs> roll call, I guess. Denise. <clears throat> Denise Mason, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wintrova, yes. Andrea Liebson, yes. Emily Wilco, yes. Uh, it carries. Thank you very much. And I believe that is it. I'm pushing the screen for the road. We're just um, here. Wait, whoever. Wait, wait, Jennifer. Is, yes, Jennifer. So you have on the agenda, and Sue sent out an email that at 3.32, uh, Rose Parkinson called to say that she, because um, she wanted to come tonight about a zoning change, and uh, she's decided that the property is not right for their needs and will not be pursuing it. Okay, thank you. Yes, because I didn't see them here, so we were assuming that wasn't happening. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I wish to adjourn. I'm adjourn. Second. Uh, yes. 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 Thank you. I love what. Thank you. I told my family. Nine thirty.